Okay, so uh, we're asking uh, Adam SEO questions. Normally, uh, uh, we'd be asking them from the uh, uh, SEO questions community, but tonight is a very special event. Uh, it's our 100th episode, and I'm so excited to be here um, with um, the people here. Everybody uh, in front of me is uh, a hero of mine, and... Um, you know, when, when I thought of this a few months ago, I didn't think it had all come off. But uh, I really thank you all for um, being kind enough to um, um, come in um, with us. Um, look, uh, normally we would do um, an introduction of um, all of the people here. Um, and excuse me one moment, I just have to press a button to make sure that yes, everything's working. Um, if you haven't been with us before, you'll, you'll quickly realise that I'm an idiot. Um, okay, so with us tonight we have um, AJ Cohn. Um, uh, AJ is uh, a, an SEO and uh, are proud of it. Um, he um, lists his occupation as marketing, SEO, product strategist and purple jellyfish farmer. He has 20 years of uh, marketing experience with a successful track record of managing marketing programs, both online and offline. Uh, AJ Cohn is a product strategist with a passion for iterative uh, product development, fusing design and user experience um, with quantitative, quantitative analysis. And I've just realised why AJ Cohn is AJ and uh, I'm me. Um, he is the owner of Blind Five Year Old, a San Francisco SEO and internet marketing consultancy uh, and blog which specializes in performance marketing with emphasis on search engine optimization and uh, emerging, emerging marketing channels. He is also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Google. Um, he's an SEO Marketing Land columnist and SEO Moz search ranking panelist who also happened to complete the Mount Diablo Challenge in one hour, 26 minutes. I hope that wasn't one minute, uh, 26 seconds. No. After uh, Alistair, uh, after AJ is Alistair. Alistair um, Lattimore is uh, senior, search, senior SEO manager for the What If group uh, of companies uh, based here in Australia. Um, his, the websites that Alistair looks over turn over more than a billion dollars uh, annually. Arthur Rodalescu, um, he's a, a search engine optimization specialist. Uh, he works uh, for Gabriel's in New York, uh, but he re resides uh, in Romania. Dan Petrovic uh, is Australia's leading internet publicist. Uh, uh, he runs a company uh, based in Australia, Dejan SEO, with uh, sites um, in uh, Croatia and Serbia. I hope I got that right. Um, and then uh, we have David Amelin. David is an author, speaker and analyst. He's the owner of Google Semantic Search, a community started to explore the implications of semantic technology. He advises companies globally and blogs for Forbes, journalism.co.uk and social media t today. Uh, as well as writing for magazines and newspapers. Um, he gives about 40 speeches or presentations a year and holds an annual seminar on SEO and social media. David has written many books which can be found on Amazon, uh, including the one uh, I'm holding in my hand, but you can't see it because I've got Alistair on the screen. There it is there. Now Alistair's back. Um, and um, I've lost my place. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, David wrote, as well as many other books, uh, but the most important, or at least the one I was holding, um, was Google Semantic Search. Um, search engine optimization techniques that get your company more traffic, increase brand impact, and amplify your online presence. Uh, David uh, can be reached on Google Plus or davidamalan.com. Um, Doc Sheldon uh, is here. Um, Doc Sheldon, um, uh, we don't know how old uh, um, Doc is, uh, but uh, 
Um, he's certainly around about my age, which is pretty much too old. Uh, he's a dog is an English Spanish bilingual with 35 years, 35 plus years experience of writing professionally. He's a member of the Web Standards Group, uh, the International Webmasters Association, the HTML Writers Guild, uh, Internet Society, and the National Association of Publishers Representatives. Doc practices uh, SEO and content strategy via Doc Sheldon's clinic, Top Shelf Copy, and Intrinsic Value SEO. Author of various ebooks, including Critical Thinking for the Discerning SEO. Um, Oh, sorry about that. I forgot to put him on the screen. See, that's twice. So it needs me a certain number in here. Um, uh, he's co-founder of TopShelfCopy.com and SearchQuirks.com. He's also the editor of a UK-based marketing e-magazine, TheMeld.co.uk, um, and Doc operates from San Diego, California, USA. His e-books. Uh, available on Amazon. Some people say that uh, Doc Sheldon uh, has forgotten more SEO than others will ever learn. He's also forgotten his wallet, his key, where his car, and where his house is. <laughs> Dwayne Forrester um, needs no introduction. But Dwayne uh, uh, lists his skills as uh, SEO, SEM, PPC, um, PR, social media, email marketing, conversion optimization marketing, uh, and public speaking and passing dog. He is a senior product manager at Microsoft uh, uh, for almost seven years, from 2008 until the present day. And a as a senior product manager with the Bing's Webmaster program, he also manages or help manages Bing Webmaster tools. So the, the, the blog. Um, and he works with businesses to help them understand and leverage digital marketing to be successful. He often mentors startups directly and also works um, with Fortune 100 companies. Previously, Dwayne was an in house SEM running the SEO program for MSN uh, in the US and in Americas. He's also the founding chair of. Simpo, uh, Simpo was Search Engine Marketing Professionals Organisation, I think, um, the in-house uh, Search Engine Marketing Committee, um, and was formerly on, on the Board of Directors for Simpo. And he's the author of, author of two books, How to Make Money with Your Blog and Turn Clicks into Customers. Uh, Dwayne was a moderator at uh, www.searchengineforums.com and maintains the big webmaster blog. Uh, he used to write for Search Engine Land, uh, where his main focus was on in-house marketing, um, both um, um, what it took to manage it and who the folks were in the industry. Um, and then Edwin Yonk. Yeah, Ed, Edwin uh, uh, is the CEO of Idis Host uh, in the Netherlands, um, and he looks after uh, um, the things that keep... Um, um, Damasio Questions Working. Masataki Wasa is webmaster of wasaweb.net. Uh, he uh, um, is a Google top contributor on the uh, AdSense forum and the Google Plus Help community. Um, Richard Hearn. Oh, sorry, Mike, I nearly forgot you. I'm sorry. Um, Mike uh, is the senior SEO manager for zazzle.com. Um, Zazzle have uh, uh, sold uh, over 32 million products uh, on the internet. Um, Richard Hearn, uh, and um, by the way, if it wasn't for Dan Petrovic and, and Richard Hearn, um, there wouldn't be a dumb SEO question. Uh, um, both of these guys uh, got us going because I was resolved from the outset that we would say. Uh, um, are some of the world's leading SEOs, and uh, without Richard and Dan, we wouldn't have um, uh, had that to start with. Um, Richard um, uh, operates redcardinal.ie. He's based in Dublin and uh, in Thailand. He's 
going to be with us only for a short time. He's just about to fly back to um, Thailand, I think. Um, Rob Mars uh, is um, webmaster of um, marketbiz.nl. He's an AdWords aficionado. Um, he um, also is a top contributor on the in the Dutch language on the AdSense and sorry AdWords and uh, search uh, um, Google help for us. Stefan uh, Hamel, um, sorry, uh, he was named uh, the uh, most influential inter in actually I'll, I'll start again he deserves it. Stefan Hamel was named most influential industry contributor by the Digital Analytics Association in the spring of 2013. With over 20 years experience empowering organisations to analyse and optimise their online channels, Stefan Hamel has cemented his position as a leading voice for digital analytics and online optimisation. Innovator, speaker and renowned consultant, Stefan holds an MBA in e-business from Laval University in Quebec City, where he teaches a graduate class on web analytics. He's also an online tutor for web analytics and business uh, analyst uh, courses at UBC Continuing Studies. Um, he is um, a direct. He's a director of innovation at Cardinal Path, where his responsibilities include. Uh, creating uh, innovative uh, company-wide solutions and digital uh, measurement strategies to deliver maximum value and insight for Cardinal Path clients. And uh, last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, is Tony McCree. Uh, he's currently uh, sitting there in Sheffield in the UK, but uh, normally Tony is based in Adelaide. Uh, he's Adelaide in Australia. He's um, Adelaide's leading uh, SEO. Uh, it runs a website, websiteadvantage.com.au. Okay, so um, what we um, do here is um, answer questions, and um, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I've clicked the wrong button here. Then I can't win. <laughs> All right. Um, Somehow or other, this question got back to back to the start. Um, I, I, I meant to move it on, uh, but anyway, look, it, it's in that order now. Um, this is a, a, a question um, posed by uh, Alistair Lattimore. He said, David Amelan has recently written a, a book, Semantic Search, um, well received and rated it. And I meant to get the actual number of stars from Amazon, but uh, I didn't. Um, He's, uh, and uh, he's, uh, Alistair asks, can you give us an overview of the thinking underpinning the book and the methodology uh, employed? Uh, um, yeah. Uh, just before you go, uh, there's a little bit more, uh, uh, David. Um, Alistair goes on to say, outside of the more common semantic markup we see uh, implemented through schema.org, such as reviews slash recipes, for example, have you seen measurable improvements by applying semantic markup to an object? For example, could Google could uh, obviously index a given web page and understand the word Brisbane in, in the context of the page it is referring to the capital city of Queensland, Australia. Um, if website owners were to be specific about this and annotate it with the schema for a location or say someone's name and be explicit about it in the markup, are there gains uh, to be had uh, in that space? Um, now you have your opportunity. Uh, uh, look, I'm sorry for putting the first up. I actually wanted to start with some easier questions, particularly with uh, analytics, because uh, Stefan is not with us for a long time, but please go ahead. Okay, um, and, and it's actually two questions there, but they're related. Um, now, I mean, the moment we start talking about semantic search, we really start talking about uh, structured data. But the thing is that although all semantic search is really structured data when it goes in a search engine index, on the web itself, um, this isn't the case, and there's a, an incredible amount of information there that is not structured at all. So let's start with the easy part of this. When I put the book together, 
uh, I approached it from the point of view of what would people need to know about, uh, what webmasters you need to know about semantic search, which is not structured data related simply because if you understand structured data and how to implement it, that's an easy, um, relatively easy thing to do um, from a certain perspective. So it leads us now to the next question of whether if you do implement some uh, structured data um, in a structured data markup on a website, um, does it help? Well, it's not a ranking signal. So if you think that you're going to implement it and rank higher in search, this is not going to happen. Um, it is a signal that Google takes on board in terms of uh, perhaps the quality of the website, but there's a lot of other things which need to happen before that happens. So, um, you know, if, if you have structured data implemented on a website and that's the only thing you have done, um, all you've done is make made it perhaps easier to index uh, in a certain perspective, but it's not going to help you very much in anything else. Um, if you have, however, gone into the trouble, and this is what usually happens, if you have gone to the trouble of actually applying uh, structured data in your markup, then you've also been careful in the way you um, present your information, in the way you structure your website, in the way perhaps that you classify um, the content that you have there, and then you've probably also been very careful in the way you um, promote that across the web. And if you've done those things, then it becomes part of an, an entire set of corroborative signals that usually end up um, as, a, as, as, a, as aids to, to, search, to ranking in search itself. But there's no direct one-to-one -one correlation, so you can't say that if we implement this, um, yeah, great, we're going to show up easy in search, and this doesn't happen. Fair enough. Um, did that bring up any questions, guys? David, you're off the hook. <laughs> I am, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, you know, in the research you did for your book, if you were noticing any of the major sites implementing, um, you know, semantic or schema related stuff that wasn't the obvious stuff, like I was saying, you know, you, we obviously see the common stuff like reviews or recipes and things like that everywhere, um, and that's fine because it's very, obviously very common. Um, in the research you did for your book, did you see any sites making a point of rolling out other sorts of stuff that was uh, less obvious? For instance, the schema.org website obviously lists out uh, a massive vocabulary of um, objects now. You know, it started quite small, but it's been expanded uh, pretty savagely in the last maybe 18 months. I'm wondering whether or not um, in the research you did if you were seeing a lot of more broad adoption of some of the lesser well -worn Yes, parts. yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question and yes I have. Now uh, when I started out at the time there were a lot of large companies that simply hadn't bothered with any kind of um, formal organization of the data they have um, for many reasons. One of them is he wasn't important on the radar, they didn't understand the implications, and certainly, uh, you know, with any company environment, unless you actually um, think you're going to gain something, things fall off your priority horizon. Now, since then, um, I've been actually involved actively on a number of occasions where the automotive industry in Europe is looking at standardizing the um, data that it holds in different silos within different companies, uh, rather Com the mother company in different aspects, so different sort of um, uh, shoots of, uh, of the mother company. And what's happened there is you will usually find that a, a car part, for instance, let's say a door, which is in a central um, database under a certain reference. At the production side, it's called something else. And when it gets to the distribution side, it's called something else again. And there's a massive effort underway now to actually formalize um, using uh, markup vocabulary. Uh, formalize these different um, data points so that data entries so that when they actually get um, to the mainframe they all make sense now, they're all joined up. And this is uh, something that's happening behind the scenes but it's actually going to have a huge impact both on the web and in, in subsequent semantic technologies. And there are going to be two wins there. There are going to be wins in terms of how the company tracks everything, understands what's happening within it, the organization. And also, there's going to be a win at the um, distributor site, uh, distributor point, because they'll be able to perhaps use specific apps, which um, streamline the process of ordering parts or um, actually understanding, uh, you know, if you have a car, which is a model, which 
which is perhaps not as current, and you're looking for specific part, how quickly it is to get. Uh, these are things which we're seeing now, and the thinking um, that's taking place at corporate level has only just begun from this. So it's a huge effort that's underway, and it's obviously costing time and money, but there will be wins, and it's it's indicative of the kind of approach that larger companies are now beginning to um, edge towards. Okay. I sort of saw this stuff coming as it's an inevitable kind of a scenario when you can see the sorts of things that Google um, and Bing and everyone else are doing with structured stuff, even into the point where uh, you know you can mark up emails, for instance, in a specific way so that you know uh, Gmail or, or Google now maybe is it can extract out the flight data out of the email if it's structured properly and then present you cards, you know. Or, you know, information snippets because it's structured properly. It seems logical to me that this would continue to get extended further and further and further, you know, and leach its way into, you know, other parts of less obvious uh, places. Definitely, and what drives it is the realization that there's money to be saved at, at organization level from having this kind of structure in place. It makes the organization a little bit more agile at its decision-making uh, level. It makes the information flow within it um, a lot faster. And it, there are a lot of, there's a lot of restructuring that needs to take place. And every time you restructure anything, there's a huge pain point. So they're, they have to mentally overcome their unwillingness to do it. And then once they start, you know, the commitment has to stay in place. But the money which can be saved, the money which can be earned, is a huge um, motivator. So it's going to, you're quite right, it's going to accelerate, if anything. Yeah, cool. So can I add something to this? Mm -hmm. on, the, on the semantic stuff, guys? Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, from our side, from the search engine side, um, we get this question a lot from businesses. Um, and, and what you've described is absolutely right on. There's a relatively slow uptake of businesses. If you look at all of the websites across the internet that are capable of using this and would have a meaningful reason to use it, um, the actual uptake and implementation of any of the semantic languages, any of them, not just schema.org, but OG, RDFA, everything, is a very low percentage. Um, and they do tend to skew toward the um, kind of higher, more um, uh, either e-commerce or industrialized larger websites. Um, their biggest pushback, of course, is always, well, you know, it's going to take a lot of work. We've got to recode the website. Things that have been templated, we now have to go in and manage one-on-one. -on -one. And it's like, yeah, yeah we, we get that. We're not saying, you know, turn it on and, and there you go, which is part of the reason why this doesn't become a ranking signal because then it just becomes a land rush things get broken, it becomes problematic for the indexes and for the SERPs and ultimately for the searchers. But what you guys tend to see is um, the kind of glory implementations that happen around um, recipes and weather answers and things like that. Um, ultimately what it all comes down to is two things. One, testing. So us finding the data and being able to use the data is one thing. So let's just assume everybody um, gets this right on the implementation side, um, then once we have that data and we know what the object is and we have a high level of trust that we know what the object is, then we can go ahead and look for the applications of where we would showcase it, which is where part two comes in, which is all the testing. Um, you guys will see this all the time, especially if anyone is a follower on SEO Roundtable. Um, you'll constantly see different versions of web pages and SERPs Somebody captures something, they saw something that was different, they posted it up, they're wondering if this is a change. The reality is it's us testing things, nothing more. And the beauty of having a large-scale search engine is you can do your testing in like an hour a day and get millions of points of feedback. So it makes it easier for us to test um, in the real world. Uh, and that actually gives us a fair indication of what searchers will respond to and what's useful. Um, the flip side is, and I know this because, you know, the, the team that actually maintains the schema.org site is part of my team within Bing. Um, it is a partnership between Google, Bing, and Yahoo, but someone has to maintain the physical website, so we actually take on that, that coding work to maintain that. Um, but 
the reality is that this expansion that folks have noted in the schema.org, um, the opportunities within schema, the markup points, uh, that is largely driven by the fact that we get a lot of requests from businesses. Now, every business is free to go ahead and suggest something. Of course, most businesses suggest something that's very useful for them, possibly not applicable broadly on the web. And that's one challenge that we run into. But even within that, you know, if you get two or three people, and the automotive industry example is the perfect example, um, you know, makes, models, um, the different option types, the option groups, the manufacturers can actually tell us what the popular ones are. So, you know, uh, if you buy a new pickup truck today, the number of options and the combinations trend toward the hundreds, low thousands of possibilities that you could come up with in combinations. We don't need all of that, but it would be great to have the top 20 most popular options combined together to know that so when people are searching on those options, we will actually be able to bring back the correct information for them. Rather than say, oh, you're interested in that? That's great. Well, here's a build tool over at General Motors. Go ahead and build your own vehicle at General Motors. That's an answer, but that's several steps in front of where they had hoped to be. Um, so, so this stuff does play very long-term value, um, but yeah, there's, there's no, you know, if you install it, you will rank or anything like that, um, which is always a tough one because you put you right back in the question of, oh, you want me to spend, you know, $400,000 on coding work this year to do all of the coding to put this in place, and what do I get back out of it? Uh, you know, you, you, and it is true, you have to have the right mental outlook when doing this type of high-level, um, we'll call it air quotes, SEO work. Do you see this uh, being expanded even further, Dwayne, in the future into more places? Or, you know, like if you were to put your finger in the wind kind of a thing now and, and look forward five or ten years, uh, you know, do you see, you know, the schema-related stuff, not necessarily schema at all, but structured markup yeah. and stuff, uh, sort of expanding into more parts of, you know, internet culture, as it were, <laughs> in terms of its um, use? I'm going to say yes, but I think what's important for us to understand is the point that you just made around it may or may not be schema. Um, I, I think what we have to look at is the concept behind schema, so the understanding and discovery, um, and then apply that to different areas. Um, you know, how, how do the sensors, sensors on a mobile device help us understand the reality of your world? You know, when my um, I have a, uh, a Nokia 1520 here, and when it spends X number of hours in one location, Cortana, which I have installed, will ask me, is this your home? And so, you know, we're having a semantic conversation. It's trying to understand me so that it can tailor results and information to me based on location. Um, and that plays a role in things. If I constantly go to a spot that it knows is a Starbucks coffee shop, it can make some, you know, attachment decisions to that, whether it's data or information, affinity, whatever. Um, I, I do think that this is a huge deal. If you've, if you've listened to Satya, if you've listened to um, any of these folks talk about the direction and future of Microsoft all up and Bing in particular, um, there is an undercurrent of understanding and trusting signals and data points knowing specifically that something is this object, person, place, or thing, and that can be trusted at a high enough level that for any given question, we very much know the answer. As we reach that, and you know, we're all living today and thinking, wow, you know, technology is amazing, and this is fabulous, and we can do all these things, and how cool is it? You know what? I still can't talk to my effing house and get it to do stuff for me. I still don't have nanotechnology that cleans the floors for me. So, you know, as we have all of this progress happening, we definitely become more aware of the world, the pieces of the world, how they matter, and how they matter to an individual. So, semantically speaking, yeah, absolutely, we are finally on the threshold of that being our future. Um, schema is, we'll call it maybe an early step in that long-term direction. Um, but it is definitely something that businesses need to continue to focus on long term, and all of its um, all of its iterations as we move forward 
whether the data points come in from a mobile device or the connect on your Xbox or you know whatever it is it won't make a difference your your nest thermostat your crazy remote controlled uh, ceiling fan um, your personal drone that follows you around whatever all of those data points are going to make up a much clearer vision that helps that data layer that the search engines are now expand and become more useful yeah that's 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 exactly right and I will add to that that the financial crisis that we went through um, was a wake-up call for the um, opaqueness that exists in the financial industry a lot of the institutions there had businesses or uh, companies that nobody knew who owned them there's been a quite initiative since then to to, to bring up Alistair's point again to actually again join up all the dots behind the scenes and create a kind of transparency in a financial database if you will that actually allows entity X to map onto entity Y which then which um, uh, then uh, gives ownership or direct ownership to the to the to who actually owns what businesses and you know we don't see that yet in terms of the impact but we will as Duane says you know that information will actually begin to flow uh, and begin to clarify how the world is put together fantastic thanks guys that's great really great uh, have we covered this guys um, is there any more in it all right I'll take that as a no um, let's um, look at uh, and the next question I run list is question number two uh, oddly enough um, it, it, it's um, titled inbound marketing uh, actually another one submitted by Alistair I think um, he said we've got a broad range of people in the dumb SEO questions community uh, some own small medium and larger websites what does the panel think um, are some of the most common uh, poorly handled aspects affecting different sized sites um, what does the panel think about inbound marketing in general uh, is it actually the big needs anybody well I'll so, start it off because uh, I see it because of the different types of businesses I see um, I don't you know sort of get a bird's overview of how things work and consistently despite the different size of each business they seem to have similar problems across very specific areas um, end user experience and customer service are consistently coming up and the reason this happens is because any kind of business runs a, a risk which is part of working that is you focus on what you're good at which is usually what the business is actually there to do and then you get how that is being transmitted or communicated to the outside world um, because you expect everybody to actually be able to understand and see what you do and appreciate the effort and the complexity of it and this doesn't happen so really um, the question addressing inbound marketing is that if you don't have sufficient avenues or channels of communication particularly in your website where what you do is entirely transparent it makes the connection to a very human level with the person who comes to your website then you're missing a very important aspect of marketing um, and you don't get to see that and the moment you don't get to see that then you begin to fall back on traditional options which is advertising and outbound marketing because that you understand there's an algorithm there which says that if you spend X amount of money and X, amount, X number of people will see you you're looking for a particular percentage in terms of conversions but really we live in a world where this doesn't really work very well social media is an incredibly powerful and very organic beast um, and when it comes to how um, the connection is made websites frequently fall short of actually um, transmitting or, or, or communicating the human aspect of them I've seen fortune 500 companies which didn't have and still don't uh, but they're working on it <laughs> a single person on their website you may as well be bots working there you have absolutely no idea that there are people working behind the company and they do a very complex task and they do it incredibly well but it's not actually communicated at website level and then you know they begin to wonder why um, they don't get any new customers 
Um, so it, it's, it's the same in a small to medium enterprise. Uh, if you focus on what you're good at, then you forget, you become blinkered to the issues of how people don't actually, uh, how people perceive you and how they don't get what you do and you don't communicate it well. And that's the connection that needs to be made, which then becomes part of the reputational gains you make and the relationships you build, which are part of the organic inbound marketing uh, effort that we see uh, today. So uh, from my perspective, uh, inbound marketing, uh, it's a buzzword, it's uh, a marketing term that is directed at marketers, right? Uh, and marketers are one of the more uh, susceptible audiences to marketing. Uh, so it's not new, it's not a silver bullet. Um, in my view, uh, Inbound marketing is a piece of the puzzle, or whatever the tactics that fall under inbound marketing. You grow a business through multiple business channels. That's going to be paid, that's going to be social, it's going to be inbound, or whatever you call it. Um, so the idea that inbound solves all your problems uh, just isn't, isn't true. Uh, just doesn't work. If you're doing marketing, you understand that you have to do paid sometimes, you have to do sponsorships, you have to do any number of things to move your business forward. To think that there's just one thing, this thing called inbound, which is going to save you, uh, doesn't work. In particular, it gets really difficult for the smaller businesses, right? Because if you're saying, hey, you need to go on and you need to produce all this content, you got to get there and you got to bring people in, and uh, you know, don't you dare touch uh, any of that paid stuff because it's evil. Uh, you know, that just doesn't work. Um, some people just aren't going to be able to dedicate that amount of time. It would be awesome. Uh, and I still recommend it for some folks, but the reality is is that the guy who uh, is uh, the sprinkler repair guy, uh, I mentioned that because I just got my sprinklers repaired, um, he's not going to go out and do a big blog post and write content about you know sprinkler heads and the fact that gophers are uh, screwing up the sprinkler heads. True story. Um, so, you know, what is he going to do, right? Um, He's going to do other stuff. Uh, he's, he might do paid search. He might do uh, advertising at the local Jamba Juice, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, so in my view, uh, all this stuff, whether it's uh, inbound marketing, content marketing, it's been around forever. If you can do it, uh, great, and do it well, uh, but it should never be the only thing that you're doing. I think one of the things, um, th this is to do with content in general, is um, people forget to, about the enjoyment or passion behind why they would create the content, and it becomes uh, such a tactical thing. It's like, how, how do I produce content to game, not game, but, you know, to get the output that I want, you know, and, it, and the motivation behind the content is, you know, Sort of misplaced to some degree, um, and I think trying to find ways to gain attention purely from a marketing standpoint, so to speak, um, is probably more important for people to focus on than how do I produce content to game Google or Bing or Yahoo or whoever and get more traffic? Because you know I think the um, in the mid term that's going to be get getting progressively harder and harder. You know, and Google have been cracking down on links. I see on the um, Bing Webmaster blog um, a little while ago, the index team um, wrote about, um, you know, that they're going to start posting on the blog about uh, index quality and links and a whole raft of stuff um, and the sorts of things that they're interested in in that space. So it's pretty clear that the longevity of people looking to, you know, just force their way into the index and manipulate their way to an end game is um, it's going to be sort of short lived in the mid to long term I think because you know the engineers are going to get smarter and smarter it's a hard problem to crack um, Google can't do it yet you know and they've been trying at this for you know probably the longest but it's definitely getting harder um, and I just think that people need to be thinking more about the uh, why they're producing the content that's not how do I game search. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Anybody else on this one? All well, right. Uh, uh, some, I say, yeah. Um, I think um, both what um, AJ and um, Alistair brought up is is true. In, you know, we're talking about content sometimes, and we tend to leap on buzzwords and think it's a it's a thing, a trick we actually need to implement, and it's not. It's a soft human quality. I mean, we're going. You're actually looking to connect in a meaningful way with the people who will come um, on your website in this case, or it will come in contact with your business in some way. And the only way you can do that is by basically aligning what you're trying to do with what they're trying to do. So, if for instance you know you're trying to buy a uh, sports watch, and I'm not selling sports watches, there's no amount of watch pages I can give you trying to convince you that hey, these are you know forget what you're looking for, these are cool. So really, if I on the other hand, have sports watches and I'm as passionate about them as you are, then there's a, an, an instant alignment there because we both want the same thing. We both get fired up at the same thing. And, it, and it's that kind of communication of passion and and um, purpose that actually wins at the end of the day. You know, it wins in business, it wins in customers, it creates the relationships we crave and, and it creates a what we call the inbound marketing wave, but as AJ has said, it's as old as the hills, right? That's where you used to go in the old market square of old, back in almost past the Middle Ages. So it's just kind of, kind of rediscovery of, of the human qualities that actually make the whole thing um, click. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons why when people ask me, uh, well, who can we get to write our stuff? I'm like, that... <laughs> You need to write your stuff, right? I mean, only you can can talk passionately about your business and what you want to do. Um, yes, I know there are very gifted copywriters out there who can do some of this stuff, um, but most people sniff this stuff out really quick, right? They figure out either you're really the person writing and you're passionate and you understand it and you, you have this stuff, uh, or it's going through the motions. Um, and uh, the other fun part about it is, is that if you are authentic, that's the one thing I always tell people, authenticity pulls uh, everything, right? Um, you don't have to be right. Um, you don't have to be right all the time if you're authentic. You can go out there, you say, this is what I think, this is, uh, this is what I believe, uh, and you wind up and you're wrong and you can still be just fine. Uh, there are exceptions, obviously, if you're truly a douchebag, but... Um, <laughs> For the most part, if you're authentic and you're out there and you're doing good stuff, that's going to win out. Um, and so uh, no one likes to hear that. No one likes to hear that uh, the way to actually do well in this whole thing is to put in a lot of hard work uh, <laughs> and yes. uh, actually Shortcuts. produce yeah. the content and do the research and engage on it and follow people and actually have discussions and talk to people and you know they just sort of want us to be like you know why can't I just you know send this to somebody in Belarus and they'll do X Y and Z and then it'll pop out on the internet and everybody will think it'll be awesome and uh, then my website map will go to, to 11. <laughs> yes. <laughs> doesn't happen. Um, or you know it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, back in 2002 even, maybe, you know, stuff like that uh, might have worked. Uh, not anymore. Okay, uh, anybody else on this one? Stefan uh, Hamel is leaving us. Uh, look, uh, um, he it, the reason that uh, he couldn't answer an analytics question is because I mucked up the order. Sorry about that. I do apologise, but Stefan, thank you so much for at, at least coming. I realise you have to uh, go back yeah. into the conference. Yeah, I have to get back to uh, the conference, but uh, uh, I will continue to keep an eye on the future, uh, the future hangouts that you do, and chime in whenever I can. Good, good. No, we've got our hooks into you now. We won't let you go. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See you next time. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. See you, mate. All right. Uh, our uh, next question um, is uh, a question. Um, ah, this is very yeah, good too. Uh, a, a JavaScript tracking or weblogs? 
What are the most common differences between a web-based uh, uh, slash JS tracking system, um, for those listening at home like, like, like Google Analytics, and a log server based tracking uh, system, or a log, log server based parser? So the big difference is um, that the JavaScript stuff obviously fires in the browser as people browse through your website. Um, weblog stuff is processed after off the weblogs or the logs that the web servers generate, typically sometime after they visited the site. Uh, generally not in real time, but there's tools that will do that too. Um, I think in more modern times, probably some of the biggest differences these days um, that really steps JavaScript-based tracking away from uh, server-based stuff is that it's provided an ability for um, website owners to push data back into their analytics platform, whatever it might be. Um, that's not practical in most server-orientated scenarios. So for instance, things like Omniture or Google Analytics um, support pushing custom variables back into um, the analytics packages. You can push e-commerce data back into those places. You can push customer data back into those places. Um, you can put uh, CRM-related information back into those places and understand, you know, the website performance of your different customer segments, whether they're uh, new users or customers or loyal customers or high order value customers or, you know, people that are male, female, you know, any sorts of information like that. Uh, is available for you to sort of push back into your web analytics platform. Um, it's not not really done in a web server scenario, so I think that's probably one of the biggest differences. There are other areas as well, jumping in on this. Um, the things that are often kind of, having had to deal with this a lot, um, missed that uh, people sometimes will, will forget is uh, because it's a JavaScript-based system, um, Certain traffic information gets missed out. Um, the uh, errors in which a log server will look at uh, basically non-HTML uh, files, so images, um, PDFs, things where people are going to it directly without kind of any additional tracking scripts for them. Generally, your web-based uh, tracking system, at least it won't normally be set up for it, uh, won't count that type of traffic. Um, and then <clears throat> often the differences that people will forget about is just kind of the understanding of what the attribution setup is between um, the different types of uh, core systems. Those will often you'll see a lot of large differences there because of that. So um, kind of understanding, uh, really trying to dive deep into understanding what, what the setups are often going to create a lot of differences in um, how the metrics are reported, particularly if you're if you're looking even more so, say on the uh, metrics like u unique visitors, which different systems have different ways of scrubbing that that data, um, and that will kind of create a, quite a bit of discrepancies there. So those are at least on kind of the metrics and to be mindful of when it comes to some differences between the two types of systems. To add to that, uh, also things like bots uh, don't typically uh, uh, run JavaScript, so you won't be able to see bots coming through, or other similar of things like redirects. So there's a, you can get a lot deeper data on the server side. And uh, it is now, uh, with universal analytics, it is now getting possible to do some clever stuff on the server. Side. You've got to be pretty tricky to get up and running. Okay, and anybody else? Okay, I'll record that uh, as a note. Um, we have uh, a question now. Uh, look, oddly enough, I don't know who this is aimed at. It's, it's titled uh, uh, Bing Search. Um, I've been really impressed with the progress that Microsoft have made with Bing in the last 12 to 24 months. Uh, this was a question um, by Alistair Lattimore, and uh, he goes on to say, uh, it feels as though there is a concerted effort happening and features are being added to search to improve it, including some examples from the Bing Webmaster blog. Uh, can you speak about some of your work 
uh, you are currently attacking at all. Uh, where do you see the future of search heading in general? Uh, is the Star Trek computer pinned up on the Bing office walls uh, like it might be in Armored Singles? Uh, do you think search is going to be the center of information retrieval uh, in a more general sense, uh, long term? And with the staggering growth in mobile we've been seeing over the last few years, uh, is conversational search a critical piece of the puzzle for success? Uh, you know what? I'll jump on that one, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what the heck. Um, now, understand, this is pure conjecture because, you know, I have no inside information at all. Um, the, uh, the reality here is uh, we have been, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you for noticing the changes. Uh, that means that at least three or four of you have been using Bing, and we appreciate that. Um, the, uh, the reality is that, um, you know, as we've been implementing things and changing and investing, um, the world of search has been changing around us. So um, it's um, it's a reality that is kind of um, chunked up and uh, slightly disproportionate at times. Um, you know, you will see this manifest because you will um, you will come in, you will see a new feature, you will experience something, and then it will go away, or you will hear from someone who has experienced something and yet you have not. All of these are, as I mentioned earlier us testing things to understand what we should roll out long term. Some of these things are obvious and straightforward, some of them not so much. Um, we recently, the, the so two years ago, pretty much everybody I think knows that we relaunched our Webmaster Tools. Um, the team that was responsible for doing the engineering work on that, those are the folks that are behind the image widget and uh, the other widgets we've recently released for websites, whether it's the search widget, the image widget, and so on. Um, those are really great tools, really great use cases for people to be able to take data from Bing, use it on their websites to improve their web experience. Um, from our perspective, it's a great way to increase discoverability where we have those things embedded, we get to learn more about a page. So there is a win-win on both sides. Now, as for the Star Trek computer, um, we, I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen any posters around of the, the uh, command center, the, the, the main deck of the bridge from Star Trek, uh, although we do have our fair share of Trekkies, obviously. Um, the reality is that, you know, that, that's a great, kind of big picture vision a lot of people can wrap their heads around. Um, but it's it's not something that is easily attainable. Uh, it is a long-term uh, goal. There's no question about it. So from our perspective, things that we touched on earlier, um, from the semantic web, understanding things, using different signals, linking different devices together, um, every one of my devices is linked in some way. So whether I'm on my mobile device, whether that's my uh, my smartphone, my tablet, my laptop at home, my laptop or desktop, the office, all of these things have activity for me so that I can maintain a series of connected points along this path so that the system doesn't need every time for me to go in and make those things happen. The system literally can, um, hello Boca, this is my dog, she knows us so. Um, the system literally will keep all that information together and put me in a position where I don't have to go take extra steps. And that's a big deal. Now when you start actually combining um, things like the data layer behind that, understanding objects and having trust for them, that makes a huge difference in getting me the matter to me. And that is where this is going. You know, we've seen, finally, huge explosion in mobile um, within North America. It's been massive everywhere else prior to this. Um, finally, North America has caught, uh, caught up on it, and the reality is that now it forces change in behavior. Um, I was recently in an event, and somebody mentioned that uh, the average smartphone owner pulls their phone out of their pocket 150 times a day and spends 162 minutes engaged with that device. I can't think of anything else in my life that I spend that much time with face-to-face, -face, other than perhaps my television. Um, I can't think of anything else I spend that much time with 
where it's the same information coming to me. I'm exposed to the same thing. Because at least on my computer, I have different tabs. I'm doing different things. One moment, I'm on a discussion forum. The next minute, I'm shopping for something. The next minute, I'm checking email. The next minute, I'm looking at news, and so on. And so understanding how people are consuming data helps us understand that um, you know we literally have to change. We have to follow those consumer patterns. And that's what drives most of the change that you see happening. Okay. I have a question for you, Dwayne. No. Dwayne, I have a question for you. No. Uh, because <laughs> can you speak a little bit about um, your partnership with Facebook? Um, Things partnership with Facebook and how that plays into this question. Um, yes and no. Um, I can talk about it in terms of we have a partnership with Facebook, and if you perform searches on Facebook um, that do not now result in uh, the people that Facebook manages, uh, you'll flip over to a Bing set of results, obviously. Or if you select to search the web within Facebook, that will be powered by Bing. Um, beyond that, there's really nothing I can talk about uh, around our partnerships. Sorry. Fair enough. Dwayne, I've got a question. Um, okay. <laughs> I know it's, uh, I mean, mobile is a big thing. And um, from a, a statistical point of view in terms of the market share that um, the Windows operating system has, you've got a, smaller, a way smaller slice of the market than perhaps um, Android and Apple. How much of an yeah. obstacle is that? How much um, of an obstacle is that to, to, to scaling the quality of search and getting the data you need to make things happen? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting problem, right? Um, you know, because it, it's tempting to think in terms of, and it's tempting for us to think in terms of, we have our own ecosystem, let's serve that first. Um, and, you know, there's a desire to do that. Um, and within the organization, we have different camps. We have people who literally say, you know what, we should make these great, amazing experiences, and they should happen in our environment, and use that as a way to drive people to our environment. And then you have other camps who say, hang on a second, Android's the most dominant OS for mobile devices on the planet. We should be playing in that sandbox. And the answer ultimately lies as a yes to both camps. You know, you do want to have really compelling um, kind of, we'll call them in-house scenarios that encourage people to use your product. However, you, you have to play in the other sandbox. There's no question, which is why you see us releasing Bing for Android, Bing for iPhone, releasing all of these features that do function and work well in other OSs. Brilliant. Oh no. He's going to come back, I hope. But that was, that was good. That was a good answer. Because the date that you. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I didn't put Dwayne on the spot, but um, I was going to say uh, if, um, um, if, if AJ Cohn had a question for uh, uh, Dwayne Forrest, that what would it be? If I did? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. When I have questions for Dwayne, I just ask Dwayne's. <laughs> uh, I think the one thing that I would uh, talk to Dwayne about, perhaps, if he's back. Uh, he's coming back. I think the one thing that interests me about Bing is more about... Um, for gaming and connects and all that sort of stuff, and the fact oh, that, uh, that I, I think there's an opportunity there for Microsoft and, and Bing to uh, look at different human computer interfaces and how people interface with uh, them, and figuring out how uh, those might become the dominant versions of interactions and what that means for search. So to me, that's that's the fun the fun part there. Um, and I, I do see uh, that uh, Microsoft has some advantages there um, in terms of having more 
devices to sort of look at and analyze and, and see. So uh, those gaming consoles and whatnot provide uh, a heck of a lot of feedback. Uh, so uh, whether it would be you know facial uh, expressions and facial uh, sort of stuff and figuring out that when you're asking for one thing versus the other uh, might mean something a little different. Uh, so cool stuff like that. Uh, who knows if Dwayne can comment on it or not, but uh, to me, that's the fun stuff. Oh, I, I know if I can comment on it. <laughs> but will you? <laughs> oh, I'll comment. <laughs> are, okay, are you guys ready for this? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> not surprising, right? Not surprising. But, you know, AJ raises a lot of interesting, um, a lot of interesting scenarios, and one that I like to play with a lot mentally is um, the the uh, self-driving car that Google has uh, going on. Eric, are you in a self-driving car right now? <laughs> Maybe you're self that's driving. I wish. I'd be, paying uh, I'd be paying attention a lot more if I was. <laughs> well, see, it's the interesting thing. So if Eric was in a self-driving car right now, the reality is that um, not only would you know he have time to do his makeup and you know preen himself and whatever else because the car would take care of it all. Um, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the voguing in the background. Um, the the reality is that you know that this concept comes with a cost. Right? I mean, somebody is going to have to bear the cost of the physical structure that's transporting your bag of bones from location A to B. And how does that cost get offset? You know, this isn't a scenario where Google runs all of these things. This will end up being a scenario where Amazon will run a sort a certain number of them. Uh, insurance companies will have them, taxi companies will have them, um, Best Buy may have a fleet of them. Um, you get into the Best Buy vehicle and your taxi ride across town is completely free if you purchase an object. Um, maybe you get into a taxi cab and uh, you don't pay for the taxi cab ride but your account is billed to charge your mobile device while you're driving. Um, along the way, because you have no need for what's around you in the environment, part of the windows is opaque and it's showing advertising for local businesses up ahead as you are driving. Super easy to make a stop for you if you'd like and run in and grab a coffee or whatever. Um, a lot of these scenarios will start to open up for us. And I think that there is, if you kind of come back to where we're at today now with this, you see a lot of opportunity with this. A lot of opportunity because those ads that will appear in those new selections and new places, hey, you know, those are going to come from somewhere and they're going to come from programs that are contextual ad programs that we buy into today. So you have to have optimized ads, you have to have good landing pages, you have to have all of those experiences as you do today will still be needed in the future. And that's where I think we'll start to see some of this technology, as cool as it is and as useful as it is, leading us back to common areas where today's industry already has a foothold and an expertise in driving marketing decisions. So there. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I see uh, Eric um, Wu has joined us. Uh, he's from Spin Media um, and formerly uh, from EHAL. Uh, and he's driving. Uh, you've dropped your daughter off, I guess, uh, Eric, and uh, now heading into work? Uh, yeah, waiting to sit on the parking lot called the 10 Freeway. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, look, uh, have, have, have we pilloried um, Wayne enough, um, or, or should we uh, pillory him some more? Hey, look, uh, Jim, I just want to say this. Um, I have it on good authority that um, the next step in the self-driving car evolution is the self-guided kangaroo. So... You know, this will be coming to a doorstep near you soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, actually, uh, uh, all right, okay. All right, well, look, uh, next one we have uh, is question five on your run list, guys. Uh, uh, and it's titled uh, Internet Marketing. And I'll, I'll throw it up open to everybody. Um, if you were to give... Um, if somebody SEO advice, or if, oh, if, if you were to give one SEO advice to someone who had never heard of SEO, um, what would you say, and how would you approach it? 
cool. It was submitted by um, um, Arthur. Um, I think yes, it was. I think it was you, wasn't it, Arthur? Yeah, I was wondering what well, were the answers. <laughs> It's not a difficult question to answer, but yeah, I'll, I'll, and I love it because essentially, if we start, you know, we, we're quite quick to talk about SEO in terms of technical um, aspects of it, but we forget that for a large slice of the um, population, it's a quick, it's a complete turnoff. Um, and Alistair mentioned something earlier, which is true. You mentioned authenticity. We all respond to that. And we respond to it because we're hardwired to respond to authenticity and realness and being real in real life. We, we have natural filters in us um, which allow us to, to judge somebody, evaluate them and uh, determine whether we want to connect to them or not. And I would say, you know, whatever you do online, however good you are, however bad you are at it, try to do the same thing. Be as detailed, be as thorough, be as real, be as authentic. And if you try that, first of all, you will only get better and secondly, you will start in the best way possible and that's the best way to approach it. Yeah, I, if I'm going to give advice to people about SEO, um, I'm actually not going to talk to them about SEO. I'm going to ask them what kind of experience resonates with them, and then I'm going to ask them to invest in things like conversion optimization and use ability. Um, those will probably have a bigger upfront result in um, moving revenue in a positive direction than SEO tactics they'll employ. SEO is something that I think most people who do not understand it need to very carefully approach it. Um, it is, uh, as I like to tell people, um, it's, it's difficult to get it right, do it right, and be successful with it. It's extremely easy to cock it up and watch yourself plummet in the rankings. And so, you know, the reality is, um, you know, I, I always lead with well, talk to me about how people are consuming your content, what pages are they engaging with, what resonates with them right now, all of that conversation. That is something that they're already attuned to. They know how many people roughly come to their website. They know this is a popular blog post, this kind of idea. And if you talk to them in terms of the things that you can do that will actually make a difference, um, you know, if it's something they can easily control, meaning it's not in the code of the web page, then they're much more likely to embrace it. So understanding usability, they understand that from their perspective, from their scenarios that they encounter every day on the internet. They go shopping on a website, they like it or they don't. They get email, they like what they see, they don't. They go searching for something it's easy to find or they have to struggle to find it. All of these are very real experiences that they can translate to a version of, oh, I only want the best for my customer, and what does the best look like? And I think that sets a lot of businesses, especially new businesses, up on the right path of thinking. You know, um, Matt, Matt Cutts actually said something similar to this at one point in, um, in regards to link building, and the, the basic idea was if you're thinking of link building and you're asking should I be doing link building, you're already in the wrong spot mentally. And, and this is the same kind of scenario where, you know, if you start on this path, you have to be aware of the path. Um, it's not straightforward. It is not a yellow brick road. There are brambles and thorns. And if you don't know what a bramble or a thorn is, well, you know, they're going to draw blood along the way. Um, maybe it's better you start in another area and grow some knowledge. Just to augment what Dwayne's saying is that, um, yeah, I, I, when I talk to a lot of startups, especially in the accelerator scene here in Los Angeles, um, a lot of them are looking at SEO as free organic growth traffic, right? So they're looking at how do I grow my business further than what I have now? They feel like they have a decent user experience. And, you know, a lot of them are focused on usability. Usually that's what I'm echoing where, you know, user experience is, foremost, the most important thing, because even if you drive the user there, if they don't convert or if they don't take that action, it's a wasted, you know, piece of traffic or wasted consumer. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing that I tell people is that they have to put themselves in that searcher mindset, right? And that's the user experience that you're trying to optimize for in SEO, right? So yeah. you just have to put yourself in the mindset of, 
I'm looking for something, I'm using a search engine, and I may not have full context of what that is, right? I may not have a photo, I may not have a video. All I have is a piece of text, and I need to be able to accurately describe to the user what they're going to see on that other end, and also accurately describe to the search engine um, what my piece of content or, you know, what my page is all about. And really, that's the focus on that user experience side that I think is the point where if you explain it that way, where you're explaining it as you got to put yourself in the shoes of a searcher, that's where they have that mental shift of, oh, this is what I do on Google. This is what I do on Bing. And user, I would expect this on the other side. And if I'm not providing that, then I need to adjust how my page looks or how my page feels to address those specific users. At the risk of being self-promotional, I recently wrote an article that was well-received on Search Engine Land about, it's called a, an open letter to the new SEO generation, um, but I think that it explains, really encapsulates a lot of what you guys are talking about here, about SEO being user experience, being relevance, um, being all about pleasing the visitor who's coming to your site. I think really that Dwayne has it right when he says if you're thinking about SEO, you're kind of already thinking about it the wrong way. And I'm an SEO, so. <laughs> Did you say I was right? That's not possible. Sorry, I missed that. Did you just right? She's purposely missing your question. That's what I thought. There we go. That's <laughs> what I'm on well. So I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump on the bandwagon there as well. Uh, I don't know. I always tell people. Uh, see, I would say, I would say, uh, I don't know. SEO to me is is everything. So I, I take it and I use it uh, to get a wedge in there. So when you say if you're thinking about SEO, you're thinking about the wrong thing. I always say no, because to me, it's a user centric. It's all user centric. Uh, how do people search for you? How do people find you? Uh, I use a funny example. You know, if you're uh, talking to an executive and they say, "Well, we do um, uh, all weather uh, water displacement sculptures," right? Um, maybe that's how they think about it internally. But you know how people are actually finding them? Uh, outdoor water fountains, right? Uh, that's the basics of you know figuring out you know how are users finding you. Uh, and why are they searching, right? Uh, it's syntax and intent, right? Those are the two pillars, right? Uh, figure out how people are searching for your stuff and why they're searching for it, and make sure you have stuff that uh, uh, that is there for them. Uh, the part that uh, I think most people don't uh, do is readability. They land on the site, and the thing is just an absolute horror to read. Um, and uh, that, to me, is uh, the biggest flaw that I see in almost every uh, every instance. So, what can I say? I'll jump uh, in there. Okay, Doc, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, just to, uh, you know, I think that what a lot of people are still not quite realizing is that with the with the uh, growing ability to actually semantically comprehend our documents it's no longer necessary to create a site with SEO driving all your efforts it should it, it, it's at the bottom of the, of the page it's all marketing it should be centered as AJ says on your users it's user centric find the right people get them the right message in the right way and trust the search engines to determine what you're you're doing is going to get you over the hump 99% of the time now and that's only going to improve with time yeah one of the <laughs> big areas that I just I while I say if you're thinking about SEO you're thinking about it in the wrong way that's more in terms of the way you're thinking if you're actionably not doing things for SEO like if you're not tagging your content with schema then you're missing the boat. 
I have a personal issue with that because I think that the search engines have a responsibility to figure out the semantic relevance, that it's not my responsibility as the webmaster. So it's kind of an ethical debate for me when we get into that question. Yeah, I'm going to disagree, Jenny, obviously. <laughs> I understand the perspective on that. I do. Um, and uh, I think that the reality is that for any of this to be successful moving forward, there needs to be a partnership on this. Um, and businesses who literally dig in their heels and say, I'm not going to do this because I think you should be better at doing this, they will end up left behind. Because if we do get better and other people do participate, we already have the answer we need that satisfies the searcher. So we're not going to expend energy trying to go do more for someone who refuses to do more for themselves. That's the reality is that for any given query, there's more than one answer. And the reality behind that is if the answer we have is satisfactory to the searcher or the answer we now discover through semantic markup or whatever, if that is um, deemed to be a better answer than what satisfies the searcher, well then the answers behind that, ones that haven't been marked up, that we may or may not be aware of, those start to become less relevant to us because they are less relevant to the searcher. Um, and that's ultimately it. And, and I think that all, you know, your perspective on this, you know, there, is, there is merit to this. I think that the solution is a partnership approach, which is why you see schema, which is why you see these things out there. Uh, we derive value, the website derives value, the searcher ultimately derives value. That's the approach. Um, and at no time has any search engine stepped up and said, you have to do this or you won't rank. That's not the reality either. Wait a minute, um, isn't that what you just said? No. <laughs> there is no tie in between. I'm you a little bit here, Dwayne, but. There is, Jenny, I have been crystal clear on this. There is no tie in between enabling semantic markup and rankings. That is crystal clear. What I'm talking about is if we have a better understanding and the searcher agrees that that is a better result, naturally you will rank higher. That is not because you installed semantic markup, it's because we have better understanding. It's that straightforward. If we lack understanding, we lack trust. We are not going to rank something highly that we have less trust on. I think that makes a lot of sense, and I'm not disagreeing with that. My no, concern has always been that it, I think it makes the barrier to entry too high for webmasters who don't understand the finer details of SEO. Um, I agree that the barrier, however, I think it's a responsibility of the business owner that at some point they are going to have to cross that bridge because the rest of the world has already crossed the bridge. Um, the reality though is, you know, and this is the the nitty-gritty detail of this point that you and I are debating right now. Um, you know, I agree that it is a barrier, and I think that for a lot of folks it's difficult to understand, and that there are plugins available for WordPress that make it super easy to fill in the blanks. But when you flip back, does that person actually understand the blanks they're filling in, and are they doing it correctly? So you know, I think there's still a lot of growth ahead of us on this. There's a lot of runway here where people need to truly understand what this is about and not think, oh, I have a pretty good understanding, so I think I'll give it a try. No, no, you need to understand it. I mean, isn't the barrier... I, similar... I mean, I don't know. I think the barrier is a good thing in some ways. So I see that similar to kind of the back in the day. Oh, sorry. Go for it. So I see that similar to like back in the day where you know, XML site maps were coming out, and uh, everyone was like, "No, I don't. I don't need to do an XML site map. Like, if the search engines are smart enough, they need to be able to crawl my site entirely on their own, right?" And I thought that that was a little bit naive. And now everybody uses XML site maps. So, um, in that same vein, I mean, Schema.org probably isn't exactly like you know, discovery and crawlability and like XML site maps. But at the same time, as plugins get better, uh, I think that that barrier of entry will be reduced significantly 
um, as long as there's a tool to provide to the user and that it becomes a little bit more commonplace. So, uh, but I think the, the broader perspective, though, is that I agree with the partnership, but also you have to remember that schema in itself actually didn't derive from, you know, search engines needing to understand stuff more. It actually is a lot more beneficial to a lot more other tools beyond just search engines. So when you consider that and you consider how much richer the, the web could be uh, if people took the time to actually identify what the strings were as things, the knowledge that we could share across the internet is way more richer than what a search engine could even provide on its own. Guys, uh, I'd like to get a broader approach of this question. Um, first of all, you need to educate the client. I mean, if I am to see this from an SEO perspective, an SEO professional, you need to educate the client in the way of telling him what can he expect to see uh, right away because all of them come to tell you, I want this now. None of them, by now, none of them, I mean it, come to me and say, hey, I want this to happen in like four or five months. <laughs> they all come and want everything now. So I think it's, uh, uh, if I have to talk to somebody for, for the first time about SEO, I need to start educating, educating that guy from the start and tell him what can he expect and what can he not. And uh, uh, to skip on and to broader a lot more, uh, I would tell a guy, get yourself a website. I mean, it's hilarious and serious in the same time. Do you have any idea how many businesses doesn't have a website? There are a lot of guys who doesn't yeah. have a website and who don't know anything about it. And they are old school. I mean, they, they don't trust um, so much the internet. And because of that, they are afraid to start walking in this area because it's shady for them. So I would start educating them also. Can I That's jump in here again? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'd kind of oh, like uh, to pose, on, on this topic, I'd kind of like to pose a question to Dwayne and David. Uh, it has been my theory, and, and I don't, maybe it's out in left field, it's been my theory for a while that Semantic markup was essentially a tool to build some validated data that would allow the search engines to test their algorithms against and, and verify, validate those algorithms. And if that theory is correct, then at some point in time, the semantic markup is really going to become less and less necessary, less and less important because the learning algorithms will will determine how to find this uh, validation without the semantic markup. Is that uh, out in left field? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you first off that um, whether you're in left field or not, um, I like the way your mind operates. And the reality is that I can neither confirm nor deny the details of how the algorithm works. Um, what I will say, though, is that we very much view um, the concept of uh, semantic and these sorts of things as trust building um, or understanding building scenarios where we have a deeper understanding of what you meant when you said subway. We understand that you meant the train, not the sandwich store, or vice versa. Um, that's the reality behind semantic. Um, there's there's not there's no subterfuge here. The reality is we just seek to understand. I mean, if you look at it this way, um, a lot of us on this call we fly a lot. It would be great to know about the specific airplane you are about to board, what its individual safety record is. If all of the data is marked up semantically, either one of the engines can return that set of results to answer your question. Because all of the data from the airline manufacturers and the industry, all of the airlines, all of that maintenance information is available on public record. So if it's marked up and we understand it, then as I board the airplane, I can look at the manufacturer's tag in the door and I can actually note the serial number of the plane 
enter that as a search, and the search engine will then bring back to me all of the related information to that particular serial number, helping me understand when the engines were last overhauled, when the airframe was last inspected, whether it has a glass cockpit or largely old school instrumentation, all of this information, how many miles are on the airframe, it's all available. With semantics, we can see that those pieces of information are related to that one object, even though they're scattered across the internet. Without that, we're kind of left wondering if that number is the same across all of these instances and if that's the right thing. And there's no real way to validate that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I would like to one more thing to this. Um, we need to bear in mind that any um, human input data um, always has a, a built-in error which comes into it, which um, creates a certain degree of uncertainty when search engines rely exclusively on the ability of humans to actually mark up data. Um, so at some point, to address your question, Doc, inevitably, search engines will continue as, as data escalates across the web, um, increases, I should say. They will rely more and more on their own judgment rather than ours. And we are all familiar with the key, with the trend and the tendency and the um, sometimes the uh, uh, sort of a temptation to gain search by simply uh, using markup, which shouldn't be there. So we need to keep that in mind as well. And Dwayne said, talked about confidence. It is critical. He talked about partnerships. That's also critical. These are the changing mindsets of the new SEO, if we talk about Jenny's article. We need to understand that you know when we do search any kind of optimization or, or apply any kind of markup, we're not thinking, how can we do this so we can rank higher? It's simply how can we actually help search engines understand better what the website is, um, and how the information in it sits in terms of its veracity. And that's the approach forward. And I think eventually search engines will bypass that human element. So let me jump around real quick. I've got 15 minutes and I want to at least answer two, uh, two quick things here. In terms of instant results for SEO and that perception that uh, you can just jump in and, and I want results instantly, um, I think that is... Uh, that is the product of a lot of people coming in with uh, old perceptions about what the internet is and can do for them. Um, you know, I, I think, hey, when the internet was the the West, the old West, you could do this. You could move out to the small town out in there, and that was the internet, and open up some crappy ass uh, GeoCities uh, shop with uh, some affiliate links on it, and. Uh, rake it in, right? Um, that doesn't work anymore. Um, the internet's a huge metropolis, and there are Fortune 500 companies now who, before, looked at the internet and said, "Ah, eh, maybe it's just a passing thing." I just, I, uh, the mindset uh, has to change that you don't, uh, you don't become instantly famous anymore. You don't suddenly become uh, the biggest traffic site. Uh, on the internet, it works a lot like offline now, right? So Target, massive company, but it started out what Minnesota, right, back in 1964 or something like that. It takes decades to get that big. Um, any of the big brands that you see today generally are decades old and they came from very small beginnings. It takes a long time. That mentality just has to find its way through the internet. Uh, it just doesn't uh, doesn't work. Two <laughs> percent of the time, I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, get me, and that gets you into the Hall of Fame in other places, right? Uh, Five hundred average, awesome. Um, so I, I, to me, that's that's it. In terms of semantics, uh, clearly that's the way things are going. Uh, entities and Extracting that stuff, uh, obviously, uh, the push for I think any information retrieval and sort of figuring that out uh, is is going there and mapping it to both uh, long, you know, web documents uh, and query strings, which is also the interesting part. Is you know, might the uh, entity that you say and how it's written vary, and how do you uh, resolve that? Those are fun things to think about. Um, Clearly, it's going to continue. 
I think the best thing, though, uh, is that a lot of this has to be done by search engines, by parsing either the text of those documents or the HTML uh, tree, the actual code in there, to figure out what's going on. Um, because you can't rely on every site to, to implement schema uh, and to put this stuff on the page. Uh, you have to do some stuff uh, that auto-detects and can figure out and through any type of machine learning can get that stuff together. So uh, I, I'm a big fan. I still think uh, any site who isn't doing it is uh, pretty crazy. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's one of those instances where you're going to get completely left behind if you're not implementing it. Uh, should you? Can you get a leg up on your competition if you do? Absolutely. Um, in particular, because I think uh, a lot of the knowledge panel stuff is going to draw off of uh, the semantic stuff and the schema markup and structured data. But at the end of the day, um, whether you whether people believe it or not, I think all these search engines want a level playing field. They don't want to skew the playing field just to those people who understand how to code. Uh, and so they do want to have the ability to say, hey, for the site that is uh, popular in that area and we want to return that result, we need to figure out how to crawl and understand the entities that are on that site and render it to our users. Uh, we need to, to learn that and be better at doing so I think you'll see a lot more of that. The Knowledge Vault, I don't know if we haven't talked much about it, but uh, you know, that process that, that in that paper basically outlines it, uh, what I found amazing was that the biggest number of entities came from crawling the, the actual DOM tree, the actual HTML tree. Uh, and the worst uh, source of entity facts was the structured markup that people were putting on their sites uh, at a really low hit rate. Uh, in part, probably because people implemented it incorrectly. That's partly because I think the schema markup is obscenely bloated and poor. Uh, but, Way too complicated. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, for what it is, fine, I get it. Uh, and the other one is it's self-serving. You know, these are people just like in the old days of, uh, you know, early days SEO. Hey, if I can get an edge up, I'm going to do this. And so people are doing a whole bunch of stuff. Right? Yep. Um, doesn't mean that people shouldn't do it. I still recommend it. So it's a huge benefit. But um, the, the big part of this is going to be Google parsing and understanding uh, unstructured data and pulling entities out of that. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm saying two things at once, right? Do it because <laughs> you can get a little bit of a leg up. But if you don't do it, eh, you'll probably be OK. Well, and I just want to point out, too, that they can't rely entirely on semantic, on semantic markup for search results because look, the most reliable sources of information, educational facilities, scholarly articles, medicine, uh, these are areas, scientific community, these are areas where they publish these papers, they don't give a uh, rat's tail about whether they use the keywords in the, in the article or whether they mark them up properly, but they're the most reliable and data-driven source of information. And I, that's my primary concern with schema and with semantic markup in general, is because I think it leaves that really important trusted element behind. Well, Jenny, uh, nobody said they di they do or they will do because even if Duane just uh, step out, but he could tell you that there is an, ah, a very small number of websites who have implemented the structured markup, so they do not rely on this. But for uh, for some products, if uh, on my understanding, for some products which are uh, available on tens of thousands of websites, they are somehow. Uh, put in a position to decide which of these websites, who they all contain the same products, should be more reliable than the others. So um, as much uh, original content you will add for that specific product and as detailed as you can get for that product on the same page would you go to, uh, that would, would ensure you 
I mean, some way, somehow, we'd ensure you with a spot on the first uh, uh, places on the search engine. I mean, everybody uh, says the same thing. Be original when you describe your product. Try to add something more to it than your competition. So, well, based on my understanding, to, yeah, go when ahead. When it comes to products in general, uh, I mean, there's some great things happening there. There's there's the GS1 effort to put everybody on a consistent um, identifier, the GTIN identifier that's similar to the barcode um, in retail stores. So there's some really wonderful things happening with schema from the really specific side. Um, products, news articles, things of that nature. Um, but my concern, again, is just I don't want to see over-reliance on it. Well, I think nobody can answer that now, right? <laughs> we we'll right. to see. <laughs> okay, have we talked that one out? Um, AJ Cohn, we have two minutes uh, of your time left. Uh, is there a question I should ask first? Um, is there, is there a question, or actually, could I um, uh, invite you to say anything you want? Mm, anything I want, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I don't know, you know, I, uh, it's me, this is, uh, well actually, I do have something to say. Uh, I'm going to blog about it, but I have to... Uh, I have a mea culpa because I I, uh, I email I, I well not email uh, on Google Plus I reached out to a whole bunch of Googlers and I said hey I think your your Google Webmaster Tools image indexation is screwed up there's a bug I've got multiple clients who have like these crazy bad indexation rates on uh, on images and I reached out to a couple of SEOs prior and they said yeah I'm seeing the same thing it looks like a bug I just tell my clients and um, John Muley, so John's like, okay, give me one of the clients, uh, and uh, looked at it, and he got back to me, and he was like, he basically said, hey, maybe you should not do this dumbass thing here, right? Um, and I was like, oh, okay, well, it's that's what's happening on that one. I'll check uh, on the other ones. Every other single client had similar dumbass problems, uh, which I had assumed that they, because I looked at the site maps and said, oh, they look like they're, they're fine, uh, but I didn't do my due diligence. Uh, and I tell you, uh, I went through every six clients who had this issue, every single one of them had a macro problem, uh, and uh, which, you know, was sometimes small, like the image server they were sending it from was named shard one versus shard three. Right, and they just switched the uh, where it was serving from, and that was causing the indexation error. Uh, but when you dug in, there were other issues like, hey, you're sending a smaller image instead of the larger image. You're sending this image instead of that image. Long story short, one of the things that I think SEOs uh, need to continue to do is to do the work, uh, to get in there and to actually uh, slug it out and to figure this stuff out. Uh, and um, you know, I I was able to fix every single one of those problems. And these are smart dev shops, right? These are people who who know this stuff, who build this stuff, and they just hadn't caught it. And so I had sort of assumed, hey, they're probably okay. Uh, trust but verify, and that's what SEOs can do. We can provide the backup for these businesses uh, if we're willing to do the work and continue to slug it out. So there you go. You'll see a blog post. And uh, hopefully, John Mueller will like me. Again. Fantastic, yeah, AJ. And um, Jim, thank you so much for having me on, and congratulations on 100 episodes. That's a that's an epic uh, epic thing to get to. So, uh, really, really uh, thrilled to be here, and congratulations. Thank you very much, and I hope that we can invite you back for the 200th episode. Well, please do. Excellent. All right, I'll take care. I gotta jump on a call. Thank okay, you, bye, AJ. And, and David Emmeland, do you have to leave us as well? Unfortunately, I have to. Yeah, I've got another hangout to leap into in about one minute. 
So um, I'll have to go. But guys, you know, every time I come to these, and I get to so few of them, they're incredible. They really are. So I'll try. I really try to come back a bit more often because they're really, really. First of all, they're enjoyable, but they're also eye-opening. I think the level of information we share and cross-reference is absolutely brilliant. Thank you, David. Yep. Right. Um, okay. Um, uh, look, as long as you don't mind, I'll keep sending you the invitations every Thursday, and uh, as long as you don't mind uh, ignoring them. Don't mind in the least. Uh, I, I just need to, to create this space to actually leap into them. Guys, thank you very much for this one. I really enjoyed it. Congratulations for reaching 100. I think that's fantastic. And I will try really hard to be here a little bit more often. Fantastic. We'll look forward to it. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Later, mate. Bye. Good to see you. Excellent. Now, look, I, I should put you guys on notice. I, I'm going to sta stand here until the last person is standing, and I don't care if it's uh, um, tw 12 midday tomorrow. So feel free to uh, take your leave when it suits you. Don't feel that um, I'm pressuring you to stay, but uh, uh, look, I'd love to pressure you to stay. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> okay. Well, look. Um, Okay, at what stage are we up to? Will we swing to the next question? We can. Okay, I'm taking that as a yes. Um, where, where is it? Uh, here we are. Um, it's question six. Uh, um, what is the most overlooked thing on a website um, when it comes to opti optimization? So I'll I'll start this one since I've uh, placed the question. Uh, what I wanted to talk about um, on this is that Dwayne and Eric took it ahead with this uh, on the previous question, and on my opinion is the usability. And by that I mean common usability, how to get what you have to offer on your website as fast as you can in front of the client eyes. And for that to happen, you as a website owner get your friends to test your website, listen to what they have to say about what they liked or, or didn't. Uh, my opinion, as uh, I'm sharing the same opinion as uh, Duane and Eric, that usability becomes more and more powerful because people got uh, less and less time to spend on a website and they tend to switch and to leave your website and get to another uh, if they think they can find it faster, the same product. And it's now uh, there are a lot of websites who share the same products and not necessarily products, I'm referring to products as a, I don't know, as a general term. So I would uh, uh, give this um, as a general advice, just talk to your friends, get even professional guys to test your website and try to, to, to improve everything to get your product as fast as you can serve to the client. I'd like to add to that, uh, I think uh, a lot of people don't really know the real reason why they have a website. They have these kind of fake reasons like number one in Google. And uh, I think it's very important you understand why you've got a website in the first place and you work towards that goal. Fair enough. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to add that I think um, it may be not the most overlooked thing, but I think a lot of people just don't do the little bits to get their technical house in order. It doesn't matter how great and usable a site is, if those pages aren't indexable, or if you've got a ton of duplicate content and Google or whatever search engine can't determine which one is the most valuable. Uh, there are just so many things from a technical perspective that can stymie you, even if you have a great usable site. So. I think it's really important to consider both. And if I had to say what's the most overlooked thing, it would be the intersection of those two. I, I would add on to that too, Jennifer, that, that 
you know, a lot of people, you know, the analogy I, use, I like to use is when you're going to throw a dinner party, you don't wait until the guests are on the doorstep to decide what you're going to throw in the oven. Get your house in order. You know, make sure that, that you've got, as you're saying, the, te the technical aspects, so your navigation and whatnot, but also you've got to have, you, you, you've got to be prepared to, to handle the conversion. Getting them there is, is just the first step. Don't go out and search for the traffic and then not know what to do with it when it arrives because they won't come back. If they didn't like the first impression, you'll never get another chance. I can't agree with you more. It's part of the reason that I and a number of my colleagues who do a lot of penalty removal say, you know, if you're waiting for a penguin refresh, let's say, there's so many things that you can do to better optimize your website while you're waiting for that algorithm to be refreshed. You might as well spend your time and your energy on making everything the best that it can be so that when that refresh comes, you are ready for all the guests at your dinner party. You know, actually, look, uh, also, I must interrupt. I, I, I uh, omitted to introduce you, uh, Jenny, when you came on board. I, I, that is what, I, I was just careless of me. I do apologize. Um, so let me make it up, tr or try to make it up, by saying that Jenny is from JLH Marketing. I, I remember that. Um, must be your middle initial as L. And uh, you're, you're from Raleigh uh, in um, the US of A. That's and right. So, sorry, I forgot. I really am. And, and Rob Wagner from expressreach.com is here too. Hey. Um, all right. Uh, any more on this question? All right. I wish um, Stefan. Um, uh, Hamill um, was still here uh, because here's a question just tailor-made for him. Um, A-B testing, can somebody share examples of success um, with A-B testing? Uh, is analytics good for this or is third-party software like bwo.com uh, preferred? So I'll take this. Um, I think you should always A-B test, and there's always a lot of success with A-B testing. So um, using something like Optimizely is probably something that you'll want to look at. Um, it's, I've used every single A-B test framework since Optimus and Offermatica, and Optimizely is by and far the most cost-effective as well as comprehensive. Um, the trick with A-B testing is really just figuring out Really, it's less the tool itself, but more figuring out what you're trying to test and then making sure that you're constraining that test to something that is eventually actionable. Um, when you're thinking about doing most testing, and if you, like, you'll hear things about, like, statistical significance and whether or not you have enough traffic and blah, 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 and how long you need to test, and it gets quite confusing quite quickly. The thing to know about A-B testing is that if you are trying to test something that is significantly different and you're looking for a big change, you're going to be able to get to your answer a lot quicker than if you're trying to test the difference of a blue button versus a red button versus a green button. Um, you know, we, we look at, like, what Google's doing all the time, and, you know, Google's doing, like, the latest thing was, oh, Google's trying different colors in the star rating. They're not using yellow. They're trying purple and orange and red. Those kind of things Google can do because they've got massive scale of traffic. For you as a most website owner, you basically will, that kind of test would probably take months and months to actually derive an answer from. So um, I would say when you're doing testing, try to do things that are um, something where, you know, well, one of the things that I, I usually do when I, I'm doing testing is it usually comes down to a debate. Uh, a designer or a developer or a product manager will say, you know, I think it's this way. I'm a user like this, and I'll, I, I tend to use the site in this particular manner. And the other person says, well, no, you know, there's this other particular use case, and I think we should do it this other way. And while they're perfectly good merits on both sides, it's one of those things where you won't know until you actually put it in front of the users, and that's the perfect time to do A-B testing. 
But if it's something like, um, you know, links need to be like at least a different color or underlined instead of just, you know, plain black text. Those are kind of obvious things that you probably shouldn't need to test, that users are probably not going to find those links unless you really don't want them to find those links um, if it's black on black or black text with the rest of the, the text that you have on your site. So, yeah. Something I always mention to people when they're talking about A-B testing is just be careful of the split. Um, and what I mean by that is if your split is 90-10 in favor of A, that's great. That's probably a really solid test. But if it's 60-40, consider the fact that if 60 liked A, 40 still liked B. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you throw out everything about B. I, I seem to remember, I, I don't profess to know anything about it, but uh, there was also um, uh, a guidance given out from Google about A-B testing that some people were, were doing it too much. Is that, is that, is that possible or am I, am I misremembering? So if you do, a lot of the A-B test frameworks will allow you to say, I want to apply X percent of my traffic to the test. So it'll only expose 5 or 10% of your users to a particular test. Um, in some cases, uh, like even with Optimizely, you can actually ramp that up to 100. So you can actually show 100% of your users your quote unquote test, which essentially is kind of cloaking because you're now showing the users one thing and the search engines won't see that test and you're showing them a completely different thing. So that's where you can kind of run into a risk of potentially cloaking, um, but I think it needs to be uh, it needs to be measured, right? Because um, if you're providing a better experience and uh, you're providing the exact same content, um, you're still running yourself at a risk. But I think at that point it's not as terrible. But I would still advise against it. Usually, what I advise most people to do is split off at most 15 to 20 percent of your, your traffic and then test that percentage. Um, you should be able to arrive at a decent number um, if you're doing a significant enough change. Um, and you're then not exposing the search engines to something that you're not showing the users. Yeah, I just realized I don't think we actually answered the question, which was whether analytics is good or third-party software was better. And I, for one, would vote for third-party software over analytics. Yeah, I mean, you can do it both ways. I would just say the third party is a lot easier and quicker to get you ramped up. Um, if you're using something like Google Analytics, which I think a lot of people are, um, you can do things with custom variables uh, where you can basically, uh, for each test, so you would have to set up your own JavaScript, your own splitting. Um, and so on and so forth. So that's why a third party uh, does it a lot better. Um, but if you're just doing plain A-B split testing, I believe Google still has a product where uh, it'll do the JavaScript split test for you. Um, and then you can just tie that into uh, your Google Analytics custom variable. So uh, a custom variable, you would have like custom variable one, uh, you give it a, a name of, you know, you know, widget test, and then the different values that you would pass to that would be your A-B test. And then um, you can then use Google Analytics to look up by value and then look at the different metrics from you know, page views per visit to uh, goals reached and uh, different events that you can fire along the way. I'm under the impression that Google Analytics only will run for 30 days now, though. Is that right? Or am I thinking of the wrong thing? Uh, that I'm not sure. I, I've never used really the Google AB split test framework, but if you roll your mm -hmm. own where you basically use JavaScript to, to split the, the experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, custom variables run indefinitely until a user clears their cookie. Is it possible for smaller businesses to AB testing, or with the lower level of traffic, is it just not practical? At some levels of traffic, it's pretty much not practical. Um, if you're talking about, 
I would say you're, you should be in the, I don't know, maybe like a thousand users a day or it, it, it's really tough because when you talk about statistical significance and the time frame, um, if you're doing something where you're, you're testing one home page versus a different home page and they're completely different experiences, um, you can have like very little traffic get to that. I mean, like um, it's all perspective of what's little, right? But you can probably do like a thousand or two thousand, um, and probably see a, a pretty significant uh, delta there, and you'll have a pretty good answer. But if your traffic levels are that are are much lower, I think you would get a lot more leverage from doing instead of doing A/B testing, but doing user testing, which um, you know, something like usertesting.org or usertest.org, I forget. Uh, basically, you can do it remotely and you can do it relatively cheaply, um, where basically you show the users one experience and they they basically um, will recruit people, like actual people, and you will actually see videos of them using your site. Um, and when it comes to that type of user testing and that kind of feedback, um, it's interesting, but you don't need to necessarily have a lot of users uh, when you're doing that sort of testing, when they're kind of giving their opinion. Um, you can have a, a sample as small as 10 to 15 people and actually be quite statistically significant. Um, it really depends on the questions that you're asking. And uh, usertest.org, they have a pretty good um, walkthrough on how to set up your, your kind of test and the questions that you would ask these users. Uh, but that's where you probably would got, get a lot quicker results um, that would actually be meaningful for your business. Yeah, so so I presume that's kind of uh, they video their screen, and so you can see people if people are struggling with a certain bit. So you, you actually get a different bit of information as well. Right. I mean, um, oh, go ahead. I think Unbounce has a really good tool for the smaller biz. Um, I think that uh, if I recall correctly, they'll do as low as like 5,000 visitors um, in a month. So that might be an option for people who are a little lower in traffic. Not to say they can't do higher traffic websites. They're just the only ones that I know of that do that low of a, of a sample. Great. Uh, so I think we've covered that one, and Jim's put me in charge. So if nobody's arguing, I'll go for the next question, uh, which actually was from me. So my question was, how do you think our interaction with devices and the internet will evolve in the future? And uh, actually, uh, I, I raised this because of uh, something from Bing a long time ago mentioning, uh, in fact, AJ Cohen mentioned it today is the thing about facial recognition and that was something that made me think uh, the future may involve the point where computers don't only see what you type but they see how you react and how how that can change the way our world's going to be. Uh, so has anybody got any other cool ideas on, on where things may be going in the future? I think I think you're on to something there, Tony. They, you know, there are already some tools that are being, uh, eh, well, I wouldn't say implemented, let's say tested, that, that use facial recognition. So you walk into a shop and uh, it, it identifies you and you get personalized uh, e-ads placed in front of you on, on displays. Already? You know, so, yeah. Uh, there was somebody, and I think I believe it was on Indiegogo that I saw. It. They they have working prototypes in alpha now. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting, you know. And and then when you start talking about the wearables, you know, at at what point will we be always like Minority Report? You know, always online, always pinpointed. You know, there's certainly a lot of possibilities there. Kind of creepy, kind of exciting. Also picking up uh, your emotion. So maybe you walk past the shop and smile at something. It knows you're interested in, in it. Uh, it could get pretty crazy. 
Yeah, I think how it depends on how far you you're looking into the future, right? I mean, uh, the facial recognition thing. Yeah, like I mean, if you look at the if you look up Japanese uh, vending machine, it basically you can walk up to the vending machine, it'll look at your face, and it'll suggest to you um, what soda or what drink you should be drinking at that moment. Um, and it, it recognizes whether you're female or male and whether what age you are and, and those kind of things. So they'll have like a variety of, you know, drinks that typically older users will want to, to drink versus the, the younger crowd. Um, and then if, if you think about more like near term, what actually people are doing uh, that are, are a little bit more innovative, that is probably going to be a little bit more ubiquitous is really around beacons or eye beacons, this idea of, um, low energy Bluetooth experience where when you have your mobile device, your mobile device is doing, sorry about that, <laughs> when, uh, your mobile device is doing a lot of different things, right, from, um, you know, broadcasting, like looking for hotspots, but also looking at what Bluetooth connections are near you. Um, and a lot of businesses, or if you look up a company called InMarket, uh, they're probably one of the, the hotter startups that are doing this right now, but they're basically wiring up like full supermarkets and retail stores and what they're doing is as you walk down like a supermarket aisle um, they'll tell you you know you're in the cereal aisle and they'll they'll do a push notification to you and says hey you know we're having a sale on milk um, you probably want to get some milk with your cereal um, so there are some really interesting applications that you can do again it's this borderline of how creepy do we get and then um, at some point, you know, the creepy factor eventually just, you know, goes away because it actually becomes the user norm and expectation as long as it's providing um, some helpfulness to, to the end user without being annoying. So, um, especially with devices and um, when we're thinking about marketing or, you know, building a business, um, there are definitely some interesting applications in the, the meat space. Yeah, I think, um, is it Google now that uh, if you say I need some milk, it will remind you if you walk ne near a supermarket? I, I think that's a new feature they've added. Yeah, it's supposed to. The execution doesn't work quite as smoothly. But, and obviously with all this, uh, they're going to be gathering a lot more information. They know where you are. Uh, they, they know so much about you and then with the facial recognition and things is e even deeper information about your particular location and how you're feeling and a lot of data so the majority of you guys are outside the US right so I'd be interested in the perspective of somebody who's not in the US where basically we give everybody every bit of information and there's no protection on privacy at all. Um, but how is this going to fly in countries like Germany where user privacy is so paramount? Do you think that this technology is going to get stopped before it even starts? Well, I think you, Germany is kind of like an edge case, if you will. I mean, I know Europe has like very, kind of like the European Union has like some stricter privacy policies, but I mean, if you think about like the UK, they've got cameras everywhere, right? <laughs> if you think about like Asia, they give away a lot of their personal information all the time as well. I think there's only small parts of, of Europe that basically are uber sensitive to, to the privacy piece, and especially with Germany. And France jumped on that bandwagon recently as well. I, I think, I mean, the, the U.S. approach... The, sorry. What the future holds on this. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, my internet connection while driving is, is not so great. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think, not that we, like, the U.S. does it right, um, but I think the approach, you know, especially with the enlightenment of, like, the Snowden stuff and the NSA and how basically there's, you know, information about us that 
you know, we didn't realize was actually being collected. And the push for, you know, SSL and uh, TLS and HTS, HTS, TS, and all these other things that kind of securing the web in a sense, um, I think that some of the things are pushing us in the right direction um, by being able to protect certain rights and certain information um, while still providing a, a good user experience, right? I mean, I think that there's definitely a balance to be had. And I don't think it's apparent what, um, what, whether there's a norm or not, or whether or not there's a right or wrong yet, um, especially in the U.S. Uh, but, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, is remarketing wrong? Is retargeting wrong based on just cookies? Or um, I don't really necessarily know who you are, but because you're coming from a certain IP, I know that you're in this area, and this area is, you know, demographically this and income level this. Um, so I'm going to target you in a certain way. Um, in some cases, there are arguments to be that could be very beneficial, where you know we're actually giving you something that you want as opposed to um, something that's completely off topic. And there's other argument of, hey, let me choose what I want instead of you trying to force something down my throat. Um, so I, I don't know if like there is. I'm not saying that there is a solution, but I, I think it definitely is an interesting conversation to be had. Just in terms of like the average user, um, I actually do have some things that I do that are non-technical. And I have heard an awful lot lately from people who are non-technical about, you know, this ad is following me around the internet or this, you know, and it's all retargeting stuff, but it's making people uncomfortable. And I think that that's going to get worse before it gets better. But unless marketers dial it down some, we're going to lose the ability to retarget altogether because the consumers are going to demand it. Very real possibility, Jenny. Yeah, it, well, it's, it, 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 on a personal level, it, it's annoying to me. I, I uh, opt out of most tracking and. Um, uh, but you cannot uh, get away from remarketing. Once I was able to, to um, um, I don't know, I can't remember what I did, but once I was able to um, um, get away from remarketing, but Google then punished me with the worst ads you've ever seen in your life. Um, you know, like um, suppurating toenails would, would, would be jumping at me. Um, and so I turned it back on. I, I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we have a little bit of a conflict of interest too here because the remarketing companies want want to maximize the number of impressions, and so they set everything at you know the max number of impressions. When the savvy marketer would know that they need to set that impression level down a little bit the remarketing vendor doesn't remind them that that's an option and I think it just gets a little overwhelming sometimes. Jenny, you make a fantastic point and I think the next level of scariness uh, is, is basically the, the map uh, location GPS tracking that keeps track of everything that you're doing. So locations, you, it, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to look at that one, but if you look at your phone data, you can go, I went to work, I went and got coffee, I went to lunch, I went over here for dropping off a package. It remembers all of that. And I'm like, okay, so how important is that? Well, and, and to take that even one step more beyond eerie into dangerous, there's a, a site now where I can put in your cell phone number and I can see your route. It'll, it'll actually show me where you went. And it's not quite real time. It's it's about an hour behind. But that I can see that having legal ramifications and, and, and being dangerous. Absolutely, I can see that at the same it's level. Major creepy. Will you share that site so I can check it out? Yes, please. Yeah, let me see if I can find it real quick. I did share a link in the comments uh, on the event page for um, the artificial intelligence learning with uh, facial recognition. So. Up there on the on the board, at least one of them. There's tons of them out there. 
Thanks. I'll, I'll check that one out too. I know in terms of usefulness, um, it's probably not applicable to everybody, but in kind of an edge case, my husband is a contractor, and a lot of times he can't remember what property he was on from day to day. He actually uses his Google map history to figure out what site he was on each day when he's doing his invoicing. <coughs> See, now that's cool. That's real world usage. Um, part of mission. I like that example. I could. I was getting a little creeped out about the whole thing, but that makes it easier because I work with a lot of people like that as well. That the plumbers, their contractors, and they get on. Yeah, I mean it's kind of an edge case, but yeah. at least there is some level of usefulness to it. No, it's a fun example because it ties right right back into some of the people I work with. So I might have to try that out. We just had a tradie in, in the house here, and he had one of these devices that tracks him. So he basically worked out that he has to have a chat with people before he leaves, because then he's on travel time rather than work time. But it tracks everywhere he goes and whether he's on the job or not, uh, which I think that's a little bit creepy. It's a little bit too much big brother watching you while you're working. I'm going to step aside here for a few minutes. I'm going to try to find this link for you guys, but I'm going to have to dig into my history. Okay, Doc. So, um, how um, are we going? Um, there's a, 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 a really interesting question I'd like to ask. Okay. Go ahead. We've just done question eight. Yeah, I know. I know the one. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no, the, 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 this this is a, a top question. Search engines are now providing enhanced results that push out the middleman, like uh, hotel search or product comparisons, or flight search, and so on. Um, considering both the supplier and the customer. Uh, do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing? I recently experienced this on the customer side and I can tell you that it was not very beneficial. Um, I think perhaps going back to the schema conversation from earlier, they might be using some schema to determine what to show and the data that was shown was far too limited for what I wanted to do. Yeah. I wonder, um, in, in terms of, um, I mean, long term, I mean, is it healthy for uh, the search engines to be um, um, domineering th this when really the service provider um, that, that's being sidestepped um, with the skills and, and um, the customer facing people and so on. Um, I wonder if that's a, a, a good thing, a healthy thing. I mean, I, I don't blame uh, Google for um, um, you know, exploring every avenue um, to return value to shareholders. Um, that, that's their, their job, that's what a co corporation does. Um, but I'm just wondering, we, you know, I mean, we're pretty close to, to seeing what, what's happening on the web. Do you think it's healthy? I think it's a uh, super no. interesting question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Eric. Well, I think it's a super interesting question because, you know, when you think about search back in the day, uh, their job was to send people to other places. And now, the Google search result becomes more and more of a destination now. When you think about, um, you know, even just dictionary, right, spell correct, how many dictionary websites were put out of business because Google now does easy spell correct. And instead of going to a dictionary now, I just actually type it into, like, if I don't know how to spell something, I just type it into Google and it tells me, oh, did you mean this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted to be able to spell that, and I'll copy and paste that into um, the email that I'm writing. Um, it's interesting because at some point, well, 
when you talk about like aggregators like uh, Shopping Comparison, Shopzilla, like BizRate, and all those guys who have basically a lot of them have gone out of business. Um, there's an extent where you know Google believes themselves to be the ultimate aggregator. So if you're going to just be a simple aggregator, I think you're going to lose the battle in the long term. Um, I think the more interesting question is when it comes down to things like knowledge base, knowledge vault, and any of the kind of factual things that people are trying to give as a service, or even potentially like hotels and flights, where it's not an easy job to aggregate that information together, and there's a, a value there, but Google is simply being able to take that data or that work that you've done and distill it directly to that user. Um, I think that's where it gets dangerous, and especially with schema, because um, it's funny that Google you know, tells people that they're doing schema and that they're trying to get people to do it. Um, at the same time, stuff with like knowledge base and some of the implementations that they're showing um, are threatening certain businesses, and you're kind of alienating the people who really want to give you some of that data. Um, so I think, and, and I, I mean, just by like, you know, different conversations that I've had um, and just anecdotes that I've seen across the web, I, I think Google themselves realize that this is a dangerous thing. And I think they have this internal debate in their own forums where basically there are people who are saying that, you know, this is highly useful to their users and that it provides a really great experience. Yet, uh, I think that there's another side where it says like we can get we can go too far and you know destroy certain businesses or alienate the people and then when you get rid of these people who are doing the right aggregation for them those people are no longer around and now Google needs to do it themselves which they probably don't want to necessarily get in the business of doing so I think that they're trying to still find that balance but I think if they're too aggressive about it, it would be very, very detrimental to a lot of businesses and even Google itself. Um, so I think they, they need to find that balance. I couldn't agree with you more, Eric. And I just want to add another layer of complexity here is that there are certain areas where people often look for answers to questions, uh, legal, medical, where Google is really getting into a very dangerous area trying to provide answers to questions like that. And they're already doing it. You know, you search for a, search for a um, symptom and WebMD pops up with the likely, the likely cause. Um, this is not a safe thing for consumers. And I think that it's a level of responsibility that Google should be very afraid of. I completely agree. Um, but the question was about hotel search, and um, I assume uh, shopping. So no, those two aren't uh, organic uh, uh, listings. Uh, they are both paid. And, um, Google does say uh, they are, are using fair use or uh, freedom of speech, but if they are getting paid, they cannot make that uh, assumption. So it is a bad thing, right? Yeah, I mean a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff. So when it comes down to like copyright and fair use and those kind of things, um, I, I'll caveat this: I am not a lawyer. Uh, so do not take what I'm saying as a legal statement. Um, but basically, a lot of times, like, factual data is basically uncopyrightable, right? So an address of a business is uncopyrightable. Uh, in, in some cases, like recipes, um, recipes themselves are not copyrightable, but if you show pictures of the process of making it, that is copyrightable. Um, so there's, like, these weird like, copyright law is, like, really messed up, um, especially in the U.S. Uh, but Essentially, that's what Google is using, right? They're they're using the fact that it's fair use, that it's um, you know this is factual data. But I mean, working at AT and T, and especially on the Yellow Pages side of things, uh, we were aggregating a lot of different business data together and making sure that it was accurate because a business might have closed, a business might have moved, um, and a lot of these databases have a lot of crust in there, and you'll get multiple results for the same business, all different locations, all different numbers. And it's hard to distill out what is actually true 
So you actually have to call these businesses and say, hey, what's your actual phone number? Or actually send a sales rep to, to validate these things. And these are all services that um, are being provided to the end user that they may not realize that to provide that level of accuracy and data, like that's you know hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. Um, and Google is coming in and, and like basically reaping some of that benefit by just saying, well, this is factual. Uh, we have fair use to use it. And um, if you basically put a lot of these businesses out of, you know, like Info USA and Locally's, and I don't, I don't imagine that the, the actual data people would actually be put out of business because they're kind of like wholesalers. But in certain cases, um, you might be putting out some of these people out of business, and they're the ones who are doing all that that legwork. So I think it's very dangerous um, that they can disrupt a, a certain industry. Uh, hotels is one of those things where you can disrupt it so much that um, you potentially could destroy a lot of the accurate data that's actually out there. So, I mean, here's an idea. What if, as a user, I could set in my preferences that when I do a search for hotels, I'd like to see results from Expedia or from Travelocity? Maybe then it would be a way that the consumer could still have some choice in what they see, but Google could aggregate the information and make it a little faster to get the data that you want. I mean, not to be a naysayer, but I, I do like the idea, but I would say that the vast majority of people wouldn't actually know how to do that or actually get to that level of personalization. I think usually the 80-20 the rule, the most people basically are just, going to see what happens and I mean that's why like a lot of people actually still click on PPC ads right because they actually don't know that that's an action advertisement right a lot of them just don't know better I think that's a really fair point but I also think that Google has a quest to tell us what's best for us so in that instance I would expect Google to say you usually search Travelocity would you like to have Travelocity be the result set for these these searches in the future. I, That's a fair I, point. They've got to be kind of cool. I, I agree. If it's up to the user, the, the majority of them will never do it. Okay. Have we covered this one, do you think? Uh, no, Mike, a piece of Kirchner is back. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> What a great hangout. Thank you very much, all of you, for, for attending. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Um, well, look, we're still, I still have a couple of um, uh, bullets in the clip uh, if you uh, uh, are up for it. So, um, and uh, here's uh, um, a one. Where can I find the best report temp templates for analytics? If this is Google Analytics, I believe they have a marketplace. Uh, I, I don't open it because my Chrome crashes every time I try. Uh, but there's a uh, there's a marketplace where you can get reports, custom reports, uh, custom goals, uh, custom. I think even filters. Uh, now, if anybody knows exactly where that is, but it's somewhere within the Analytics admin section. I also have a link. I'm looking for it now. Didn't uh, Luna Metrics had some really nice templates? The other thing that I can offer is basically, I don't know if they're looking for uh, Excel doc spreadsheets where you can pull the data in and aggregate that way uh, and, and then have uh, uh, some of the different uh, functionalities within Excel to do some quick as exports for executives. And I think that goes also into uh, comment before the actual uh, website for Chrome and the admin. I haven't been in there to look for them lately.
I've just found it. It's uh, called the Google Analytics Solutions Gallery. And uh, uh, you can basically go in there and find lots of reports and uh, you can, people vote them up and down. And they're for lots of different sections. So a, a great place to start if you're looking for them. And to find that, probably the easiest way is to Google. Google Analytics uh, Solutions Gallery. Okay, that's uh, and Jenny, you're still looking for that link, are you? Yep. Okay. Yeah, when I find it, I'll post it in the thread. All right. Um, we have two questions to go, guys. Um, if you're up for it, um, this one's titled uh, Google Webmaster Tools, Analytics, and AdWords, um, and the question is, uh, how can I connect analytics? Webmaster Tools and AdWords, and how should I use the extra data? Well, they all kind of have different little setups, um, depending on which tool you want to uh, work in. Um, you First off, you can't actually connect the data into Webmaster Tools, but you can connect some of the other data into either AdWords or into Google Analytics. Um, the uh, Webmaster Tool data, you have to do some really weird kind of back and forth, um, both within Google Analytics as well as for AdWords. Um, <clears throat> generally, it's suggestive to have the same email address for those. Uh, just makes it easier, or the same account, I should say. Um, and this is not the easiest way to explain it because I don't have a visualization chart in front of me to show you where to do that. Um, so, yeah, if you're looking, there's usually under, uh, do you guys remember which section it's called? Um, in AdWords, what, what tab it is. I know there's a tools tab. I'm not in the right account right now. But, Sorry, Michael. What um, what are you where, looking for? Where's, uh, where's the tab where you go and connect it specifically to web, from for Webmaster Tools inside of AdWords? You have to like go there first to request adding Webmaster Tools, and then you got to go to Webmaster Tools to confirm. I think it's in the in the settings menu under the gear icon. Okay. Yeah, it's that part's a little. Back and forth. Um, something I gotta I don't have my profile open for AdWords at the moment. Um, but yeah, so so how to use the extra data? Um, we can at least address that part, unless anybody else knows how to quickly talk about that data. Connection. Oh, okay. Um, how to use the extra data? So well, um, we've got uh, by adding some of the Webmaster Tool data into Google Analytics. Um, that data you can drill down a little bit easier comparatively than Webmaster Tools. Uh, Webmaster Tools is not really an analytics platform, so the utility and the user experience of that is far less than compared to Google Analytics. Um, so you can pull out and segment data quite a bit better uh, in, in uh, Google Analytics with the Webmaster Tool information. That said, you do get um, the data is not going to exactly be the same, so just be aware of something like that. Um, the extra data that you get in AdWords, so you're connecting analytics, or not data, sorry, Webmaster Tool data, you're able to get a comparison um, by organic and by paid and, and uh, both, and so you kind of use that to see how you're doing, so if, if uh, kind of part of the one of the old debates, which was, uh, does having your PPC up as well as uh, your organic in the same kind of keyword slots, um, you know, position one for AdWords, position one for organic, does that help provide an additional lift? And you can kind of see that uh, with the extra data. So it's very nice for kind of that information in there. Um, that's usually kind of some of the quick 
nice little things with the extra data um, that I've at least used before in the past. Yeah, the other one is linking analytics to AdWords. And the obvious benefit there is uh, doing a conversion uh, tracking. And you can also link your remarketing and things like that for remarketing lists, which you can do either directly in AdWords or via list and analytics. And a, a recent feature uh, is you can add columns now to show uh, bounce. Uh, analytics data, which is bounce rate, uh, average page views, uh, and I think that's a, quite a useful new addition. Uh, so you can actually see a bit of uh, user behavior directly within the AdWords side. Of things. But you cannot move all the data over, can you, uh, Micah? No, 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 it's a good point. It's, it's only a um, limited data set. So it's, and I mean, that's with Master Tools anyway. My Master Tools is a limited data set. Um, same thing for AdWords, you only get a limited, it's still a large data, but you only get uh, still some form of uh, limited data that you would never get in AdWords. Um, also, actually, what's really cool um, is if you're more on the SEO side, um, connecting your AdWords together is with um, uh, 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 analytics is pretty good for auditing purposes. So um, I've run across way too many situations where the <coughs> PPC side doesn't do very good tagging. So um, <laughs> there's yeah mistakes happen. So like it's a great way to kind of audit what's going on. Um, to see where the issues are occurring and then leverage kind of a mismatch of the data between AdWords and analytics to go and fix some of the tagging campaigns. And there's hundreds of ways that, you know, reasons for why it can occur, but it's great for more or less debugging purposes. As far as I know, for uh, the uh, data imported in uh, Google Analytics from Webmaster Tools is just the search queries, the top queries, the top pages, and all the locations. So not not much of the data from uh, um, Webmaster Tools are imported into uh, Google Analytics. So I would use them both, uh, to be honest. You get, um, you can segment actually a little bit better. You can do... Um what is it? Uh, second dimensions, which normally you can't do in Webmaster Tools. So, you, if I recall correctly, at least unless they changed it the last time I've done it. Um, so, you can actually kind of do a bit more drill down than otherwise. But that may have, they might have provided additional features and or taken out those features. The last time I looked at it, it hadn't uh, taken on the new Webmaster Tools accuracy, where they were giving less than 10. The analytics were still doing the, uh, I think they just reported them all as five. Uh, but I might have changed as well. Another thing you can probably add for your tracking with your is the UTM codes. I don't know if uh, you guys quite mentioned that, but UTM, you know, push that information in, not from Webmaster Tools, but Google Analytics really helps. So especially if you got a really powerful campaign that you're pushing that's an event coming up or whatever it else is, you can actually track that just like an email campaign under your campaign staff. I think the only other thing I would add to that if you do a UTM code is to add an uh, annotation with inside your analytics your analytics to make sure that you can identify what that spike in traffic was at the same time so you can go through additional dimensions um, and also uh, visualize it through the, uh, the flow through data reports. Very powerful stuff. Conversion. Looking for high bounce rates, bringing those bounce rates down, optimizing for the entire site. Okay, we probably should go f further with that, and if, if somebody objects, I'll be happy to uh, um, uh, concede. 
Um, but I, I, I've got one last question to cover. I'll take that as uh, assent. Um, this is a question, uh, uh, how to move analytics data? Is there a tool or a trick uh, to capture uh, all old data from one analytics account and move it to another? I'm pretty sure such a thing does not exist. It doesn't exist. That could work. Can you hear me? Because I can't see anything move at the moment. <laughs> um, we, we can hear you, uh, Robert. You've got a black screen. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, the way to at least uh, get some of the data in there would be to make reports and afterwards import those reports into your new analytics account. I haven't tried it yet, but that's the way I, uh, I heard you could get uh, the most important uh, data back in your new account. There is no other way. So, Rob, is that with the enterprise version of analytics that you can import that data, or is that with the free version? The free version. Uh, I didn't know if there was an API yet available for that. Um, no, I heard it was somewhere. It's quite new. Uh, there is somewhere uh, a tab where you can can uh, import data. Okay, I'll have to check but that out. Uh, any further into it yet, but. Uh, I will let you know if it works. Yeah, let me know. I'd be very interested to find that one out because I know that a couple other uh, people that I know are actually trying to do something similar, but that's on the enterprise analytics. Field. So I'd like to see if it's actually available on the free version too. Yeah, and I have another way. Found another way that that's not not as exact, but there is a free trail of uh, trial of uh, Swido. And in Swido, you, you can make reports from different accounts into one. So you would still need the old account to be accessible. But then you could uh, make one report out of two accounts. Yeah, now, if the account is not accessible, there are ways you can recover it just by having access to the website that it's associated with. So no, that, that the doesn't work. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the old analytics is a property of somebody else's analytics uh, account. That's ah. a web builder who puts analytics uh, for all his clients in his own account. Well, that was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's stupid, but it happens. Well, a lot of SEO agencies uh, in the Netherlands also do it. it. It brings me back to the whole days of uh, putting all the domains of your clients into one uh, account as well, and, and then you know, they want to move away from your your services and. It's like almost nearly impossible to move that domain or even the hosting. So that's just my two cents. But yeah, I think I want to check out that analytics stuff, though, because I mean, if you could take even what you find, uh, going back further in the conversation earlier, back to the log files of uh, or the server files, um, and then be able to, to consolidate some of what you're already finding, because there is some value of information that comes from the server logs versus just what comes from a JavaScript log. Um, you know, going for even the uh, keyword not found or not provided information, you can probably pull that with some advanced uh, tools. But, you know, being able to uh, consolidate that data into one interface that you can visualize and pull segmentation out of on top of what we already have with the Google Analytics um, capability with uh, conversion analytics and tools to, to help us reduce the bounce rates and so on. Exciting stuff, though. Right? Okay. 
I, I see uh, Edwin found uh, the link uh, already. And we got Mark Traffic in here as well. Mark, welcome. Hey, howdy, everybody. Thanks for the invite. Uh, nice to be here for a little while. Yeah, you've got uh, Eric's birthday going on. Hopefully, you guys got a good old party cake going for in the office. <laughs> well, uh, his office is about uh, 700 miles away from mine, so the cake will probably be stale by the time it gets there. But, uh, but we're, we're, yeah, we're there's celebrating some... our own ways. Yeah, I forget that you're some together and then sometimes not. It's... We like to we like to keep people guessing, you know. Uh, people trying to guess, you know, are we the same person? You know, are we sure have we ever seen the two of them actually together? Me well. So Jim, what's our next question? Um We've 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 expended them all, uh, so feel free to ask your question, would you, Rob? Okay. Well, up in the chat, one of my questions is uh, affecting. Going back to some of the things that we talked about of Google's uh, effectiveness on paid advertising, remarketing, all those different aspects. One of uh, one of the industries that I find is going to be really affected next month, and it was written up uh, by Barry Schwartz, uh, and helpful with my client actually helping to, to <coughs> the fact that there was a real email sent from Google sending that he his account was affected based off of the things that he sells. Um, he's one of the biggest distributors in the United States for paintball gear, safety equipment, you name it, he's got it. Um, but him as well as almost the entire, well actually the entire industry has now been affected that they won't be able to sell anything online. And my question is, has anybody else effect, had effect of these emails coming to them, not necessarily in the industry that I specified, but maybe in a different industry for this next month's uh, Terms of Services update? No. There's silence. Well, I'm reading that. Yeah, go ahead. I'm reading that. Oh, you're reading it. Thanks, Edwin. Appreciate it. And of course, I'm such a dummy. Uh, um, it, it wouldn't matter uh, if if I was tired or not. I, I still wouldn't have a clue. While people are thinking, I've got to get off because it's tea time. But, uh, I've got to have a quick drink uh, celebrating 100th episode. Good work. That's the show, guys. Good job, uh, Tony. Good job. Did you Thank see you. my little message I sent you, did you? No. <laughs> did I miss a have a drink message? Yeah. I, I said... Um, um, I think we deserve a glass of red, Tony. Oh, no, you couldn't have seen it because you, you came, out, came out with white. We got a um, white. <laughs> thank you for your contribution, mate, by the way. Um, what like a great mm -hmm. See you guys. See you, Tony. Well, I think I'm going to take the opportunity to bow out too, but uh, I'll raise my coffee cup too. <laughs> yes, Jenny, um, thank you very much uh, for tolerating uh, our, our um, mix-ups and uh, my um, rudeness and carelessness. <laughs> That's okay. I'm used to getting ba bashed in the comments section. I can handle it. Oh, I, well, I, I can testify from personal experience that Jenny is one tough lady. You know, don't worry about her. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. All right, guys, I'm going to run. Good to see you all. Great. Thank you for your help, Jenny. Anytime. All right, guys, I'm going to probably bail out here too, but Jim, I just wanted to say thank you um, for having me on the show, and, you know, it was fun. Lots of great stuff being answered, and, and I look forward to the next one. So, have no a problem. fantastic no, no problem. Uh, we're, we're back. Uh, 
in two years to do it again. I'll do it all again. You got it. We'll catch you later. Okay. Uh, gee, I was stressing over this one, Mark. Well, all went well, didn't it? Uh, I'll, I'll watch it later. I, 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 I was everybody. Uh, the people I asked um, thought it was thought we did okay. I, I really screwed up the uh, introductions, but anyway. Well, and uh, you go on. I was going to say I'm thankful. Uh, I obviously got in kind of after the uh, after it all happened, but uh, I had some other hangouts and things I had to be on this morning. But uh, glad to be here for this, even just to say hi and uh, congratulations on the 100. Uh, keep them going. Yeah, yeah but we, we'll just um, do the one week at a time. Well, they, yeah, the opportunity to get those people back. Um, uh, on the 200th, we, we might start doing three hangouts a week, guys. Um, bring it uh, forward that much quicker. <laughs> yeah, I just turned 57. My time's running out. You know, you got to accelerate this a little bit. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm 63, yeah, Mark. Oh, you're giving me hope. I've got a few more years left. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we're... we're when you get past a certain point, there's no no point. Um, um, you, you, all all that's left is to keep putting one foot in front of the other. I must say though, I'm I'm, I'm starting to get, get get a little bit doddery. You know, the the, the 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 things that I used to look at old people and think, oh, they 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 are really strange. You know, well, that's me. <laughs> Yeah. And, and Rob Mars, of course, he, he's not as old as me, he just looks older. All right, well, con congratulations again. Uh, thanks for what you're doing, and uh, look forward to future shows. Yeah, great, Mark. It's, it's good to see you. Um, we, I wish we'd see more of you uh, um, in, on the, um, you know, um, th Thursday nights. Uh, I, I suppose there's clashes and I don't know how you, how you cover it uh, for time-wise, though. Yeah, Thursday's a, Thursday's a tough day for me, but I will definitely try whenever I can. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate the invites, and, and I, will, I will be back. Uh, okay, man. All right. Thank Take you, everybody. Going. And then there was um, uh, five of us, five of us, and six... Six viewers still watching. We hope that uh, you enjoyed um, tonight. Um, seven viewers. And uh, Edward, and, um, you want to close here? Yeah, I think we're we're done. And you're almost sleeping there, Jim. <laughs> I, I've been it's getting lower and lower. And 20 hours straight, mate. I got up early to get everything ready for last night, and I finished it uh, just, you know, in the nick of time. Uh, believe <laughs> Well, you, you did an excellent job, uh, Jim. Oh, look, mate, I know it was rough, but um, anyway, you know, we, we can't, we, I mean, we can't do any worse, um, and, uh, you know, as long as we get by. Anyway, look, if you're still watching us, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, your your um, interest in, in what we do makes what we do worthwhile, and uh, for that we thank you. Uh, we'll be back at the same time uh, next week um, to do it all again. Thanks very much. <laughs>